confirmation to order this being Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. <clears throat> the first item will be the invocation, and what I'd like for everyone to do is we're going to take a moment of silence, and I'd like for you to remember any loved ones that may have passed away during the year. Uh, maybe they're sick or have other problems. And think about the tornado victims in Kentucky and, and uh, Ohio or and Arkansas in particular, and then even think about the uh, big fire they had in eastern North Carolina over the weekend that put 3,000 people out of work for a while. So let's take a uh, moment and moment of silence and just bow your head and, and remember these people. Okay, the next item on the agenda is going to be a swearing in an oath of office for our newly elected commissioners, and we're uh, honored tonight to have uh, Judge Alan Thornburg with us. Uh, he's performed this task for me, I think, the last time that, that I ran, but uh, Judge, if you'd like to come up, and we're going to swear in Commissioner Edgerton and Commissioner McAllister. If you all want to walk around to the front up here. here. Constitution and laws of the United States, that you will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the state of North Carolina and to the constitutional powers and authorities which are or may be established for the government thereof, that you will endeavor to support, maintain, and defend the Constitution and laws of said state, not inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States, 
to the best of your knowledge and ability, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of your office as town commissioner for the town of Woodford. So it be done. No, we'll give that back to you and then Ryan will okay. coordinate any other signature that he may be dead and it needs to sign. Okay. Okay, I'd like to congratulate all three new members of the board. Look forward to, to working with you. Uh, the next item on the on the agenda is approval of the agenda that everybody got a copy of. We have a motion uh, to approve the agenda. Discussion the one item. Oh yeah, one item number nine. Uh, we're striking, which is follow-up discussion on rezoning property, Blueberry Hill Road. Uh, I imagine that'll come up at some later time, maybe next month or sometime. It may. It may. Yeah, they may have to take it off, so anyway, strike that if you would. So we have a motion to approve the agenda with that one deleted item. May we accept the agenda? Do we have a second? Second. Have any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the next item will be a vote on the mayor pro tem. And as everybody knows, every governing body has a mayor and a mayor pro tem. Uh, so at this time, I will entertain any motions for Mayor Pro Tem. I'd like to make um, Mr. Munster. He has been on this board for many, many years. He's been in Woodford many, many years. He knows the town and he knows the history of the town. So I nominate Mr. Ronnie Lunsford. Okay, we have Ronnie Lunsford. Do we have any other nominations? <coughs> Well, I was going to nominate uh, Jim McAllister. Okay. Any other further? Jim, have Ronnie Lunsford, Jim McAllister. Do we have any further nominations? Okay. Hearing none, do we have a motion to close the nomination process? Second. 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 Any discussion? All in favor of closing the nomination say aye. <coughs> Any opposed? Okay, now we will vote. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board as to do? Do you want to do it by written ballot? Do you want to do it by uh, voice vote? We'll do it by voice vote. Uh, we'll take them in reverse order. Uh, first one is Jim McAllister. Aye. 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 Okay, we have four votes for aye. Four aye votes for McAllister, excuse me. <laughs> okay, next is uh, Ronnie Lunsford. Okay, and the vote is four for Jim McAllister and one for Ronnie Lunsford. Uh, Jim, we'll send you all of the big book of everything here to memorize, you know. As your heir says, you need a good memory. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Next item will be the consent agenda. And we have five different items on there. Uh, Administrator, do you have any comments you want to make on any of the five before we vote? Not necessarily. Of course, the first is approval of minutes. That's a regular housekeeping item. 
um, for the board. The second two are also how she can eyes, as it, as it were, we're conforming to the state's record retention schedule. She was just as well to report that we are uh, conforming to that. Uh, the third, the fourth item, excuse me, is a budget amendment uh, for 911 consolidation in Clarkson County. You may have read Asheville um, City is entering into an agreement to articulate that may be under consideration or has been recently passed by the city council. Um, and so this is a, this is what this does. And then this is the existing share of that cost, which would be for two years um, to work through that consolidation process. And the third item is just to uh, approve the acceptance of a grant uh, for the police department um, that you all have heard about, the board has heard about in, in the past uh, as Chief has applied for that. Anybody have any questions about any of those items? Need further explanation? I'll say, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, moving on to public comments. Uh, were the public's invited to attend in person or view this meeting on Facebook live? Uh, we have two, uh, got two people. One of them may have struck their name off, but anyway, we've got the first one is Mark Hunt. Uh, Mark, you can come up. I think everybody knows you, but if you'd repeat your name again, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Mark Hunt. I'm here to speak to the project, the Woodfin Greenway and Blueway project. I've been involved sort of on the civic front as a volunteer, helping uh, everything from fundraising to political support since 2016 when a bond went on the ballot. And I, the main reason, uh, also my family has made a significant financial contribution to the project as well. Uh, and I'm staying active. I'm supporting every way I can without overstepping bounds, hopefully. Um, I'm here tonight to express some appreciations because I'm, I'm just concerned they might not be done well enough. So my first expression of appreciation is to the commissioners from this board that have left recently. Debbie Giesen Tanner, Jackie Bryson, Don Hensley, uh, and Don Honeycutt. The bond went on the ballot in 2016 for four and a half million dollars. It took significant political courage for those commissioners to have the vision for this project and to put that bond referendum on the ballot. And of all the moments that have passed in the evolution of this project, that is a really big one. So I know those folks aren't here tonight. I hope maybe they'll hear about this, but the community appreciates it. I know I speak for a lot of Woodfin citizens a lot of project partners, and uh, I hope we don't lose sight of that important role that those folks play. And of course, the, the remaining commissioners, including Jim Angel, Mayor Vianna, uh, appreciation to all of you. Ronnie's put a lot of time into this project. Thanks for everyone. I know the, the newer commissioners um, are supportive similarly. It is a great project. It's a complicated project. There are occasional bumps in the road. The project is lucky because of the great political support it's had. It's also, we're also very fortunate for strong staff leadership and support. We've got a new project manager, Luke Williams. Adrian Eisenhower's put time in on it. Eric Hardy, who has announced his retirement, effective very soon, has been super instrumental the past year and a half. And the project is doing very well as a result of everything I've just said. Another reason the project is doing well is our partners in the design community. We'll hear from Equinox tonight about an update on uh, design progress on a certain part of the, of the big project. The news is all good. I know Walt Brewer will brief you from the advisory committee standpoint about the work they've been doing. I know that's good news. And, and staff will provide an update later. So I don't want to get too much into the details of the project. It's an $18 million project. The Woodfin bond was four and a half million. Uh, some of the hard work that's gone on over the years is to pull in over five million in federal funding, two and a quarter million from the Buncombe TDA, 
over a million from Buncombe County government as a line item appropriation and almost a million in other miscellaneous, not miscellaneous, other very important fundraising, but together almost a million. So we're, we're at 15 million in funding in hand for this ambitious, complicated $18 million project. That is excellent progress for this point in time. Construction is set to start on the next phases about a year and a half from now. There's, there is time to close that gap. Matter of fact, we're kind of where we want to be at this stage in terms of fundraising, I think. And, and I know Eric briefs folks on this each month, but I, I'm just expressing optimism and appreciation for where we are. Riverlink is a key partner helping organize some of this fundraising. And um, I'm super optimistic about their role. I, you know, some, somebody that doesn't get all mentioned often enough are the property owners along the French Broad River and along Beaver Dam Creek who are supporting this project with donations of easements or bargain sales of easements in which the Greenway will sit. And the value of their support, we haven't tried to put it into dollars, but it is, in, it's, it's a lot. It's right up there with some of these other big funders. And I, um, I think they deserve appreciation since we're in the business of appreciating folks. Um, so as, as we move forward um, with the project, my one suggestion for the board is, I know that there are challenges on, on other political fronts that you'll be dealing with. The great news for the project is it's broadly supported. 71% of Woodfin voters voted for that bond referendum. And I, I, I think I know that the current commissioners are broadly in support of it. And so I, I, I beg that Whipping Greenway and Blue Way, despite little bumps in the road we might see, remain supported and that the political leadership continue to support staff resources and, and good design and everything that goes into making a good project. So I'm gonna stick with it till we get it done. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. John Warren, is he still here? Okay, that was everybody who had signed up to speak. Uh, okay, moving on to new business. First item is the ABC Board Monthly Report. I don't believe she's joined us tonight. Um, she had a bit of a commute to get here because of a stretch. So we'll follow up with uh, the board and get those reports to you after this meeting. Okay. Uh, next item, Riverside Park and Whitewater Way. That's a good intro to this next item, Mark. It is, and I'll start it off. Um, but before I do, I'd also like to welcome the new commissioners on behalf of town staff. We're looking forward to working with you getting a lot of work done there's much to do so thank you for joining this town board and for your service to the community appreciate that very much um, so in just a moment I'll introduce David Tuck who uh, most of you would know but uh, before we do that um, I wanted to do just a brief recap of how we got to where we are tonight uh, for the benefit of the new members as well as for those uh, in the public that uh, could use a refresher on this uh, the town entered into design contract with Equinox Environmental in the first quarter of 2021. Um, and that was a combined design project, not only for Riverside Park, but also for the way, the Whitewater Way that's adjacent to the park. Because of the relationship between the two and uh, one needs to be designed with the other in mind and one will be built uh, with the other um, also in play and in coordination with the other, it was important to design those together. And so Equinox uh, provided a, a really solid proposal to the town um, and brought with Equinox, they brought with them several partners who are gonna help make this project something that Whitman can really be proud of. Um, and I have all the confidence in the world about that. Uh, one of the first things that they began to work on, and this was one of the, the differentiators, I think, in their proposal from some of the others, is the reliance on community and public input. And so immediately um, scheduled and hosted uh, public forum, open house, um, and we conducted that via, via Zoom like we've done everything else for the last two years. Um, 
and uh, we, had, we had good attendance and, and questions from the public, and people near and far joined in on that. Subsequently, and, and uh, simultaneously with that, uh, also launched a public survey um, and soliciting feedback on the park, what would you like to see, uh, what's important to the project success. We had 623 responses, which is really remarkable. Um, there was some, some sort of magic that they sprinkled on that survey. Um, either that or the project's really important to the town, and I think that's what we, we would conclude. So uh, Mr. Tuck will, will walk us through how that input then factored into and fed into the design that you'll see tonight. Um, the uh, Equinox did also check in with the advisory committee at several points along the way, leading up to this meeting. And uh, our, our chairman of the advisory committee is here also to address the board after the presentation uh, to discuss what the advisory committee's position and interests are for the project. And so what we'll, we'll share with you those items. And I won't go any further into the details on this particular slide because David's gonna cover what comes next. Uh, but we're glad to, to welcome them tonight. Uh, for you all, we're looking for a nod. So proceed based on this design or not or some alteration of that, some redirect, so that they can begin to get to work in sharpening the pencils on the cost estimates, which will come after, um, and then we'll work to refine those too and see how those fit with our budget um, and what we need to do to make this project a success. So I will turn it over to David because he's the star of the show. Thank you, Eric. Okay. <coughs> so it's really nice to be here this evening uh, to be able to talk with you about the project. Uh, as Eric said, we're really looking for approval on the site plan. And the reason we're looking for that is before we get into more detailed design, we want to make sure that we have this the way that you all would like it. And so I think that's really important. So we're not worried about the individual features or elements, but more the big picture layout of what we're proposing. So um, one of the things that I just want to touch on, or a couple things I want to touch on are, are highlighted right here um, with this slide. So I want to provide a refresher on the master plan that was developed back in 2000, and then what was identified as phase one that was going to be part of what we were taking forward as part of this project. Um, I want to share with you the information that we have since that master plan obtained and how that informed the new updated 30% site plan. I'm actually going to run through the site plan and then I'm going to provide a timeline update. What Eric actually had up just a few minutes ago was a, captured exactly what we're talking about. So that's good. We're, we're showing the same information. <laughs> so let's see. Next slide. All right. So the original plan. Uh, this is the original plan that we developed. And so the next slide is really going to highlight. You can see all the, in the legend, all the um, labels. And you should be able to see, there's a little bit of a lag on here. You can see what happens. There we go. So everything that was hi is highlighted on this slide, I don't know if you can read it all, but these were the elements that we were asked to take and then develop as part of the first phase and the detailed design work. That, so all this is captured in the site plan. Um, but before we really got into the developing this plan, um, and this is the wave as well, we went through the public survey that was referenced by Eric as well, over 600 respondents. And what was interesting, um, this graphic really shows the town of Woodfin responses and non-resident responses. And what was really interesting to me is there's a lot of consistency between what the residents would like to see and the people in the surrounding county. This also, in addition to just some basic elements that we asked people what they wanted to see, we also asked them for general comments. And what you're seeing here is in the, the, the larger letters at the top are the ones that were mentioned more frequently, and it goes all the way down to the things that were mentioned less frequently. So again, this is Woodfin responses. You can see access and keeping the park peaceful were really important. And then non-Woodfin residents. Um, it was really interesting, super excited. We, we would get a lot of that. Really excited, we wanna see this happen, we can't wait. Um, but also the, having a park for multiple age groups and having connectivity. So some of the concluding factors from that survey from those 600 plus respondents included connectivity and access, accessibility. That's not only to the park, but within the park. Shelter and restrooms. Recreational activities for all ages, which we already mentioned. Habitat restoration and, and ecological focus. 
because it's so close to the water and the resources and water quality was a big concern. And then, of course, that access. And then just general concerns that folks had, no matter, it didn't matter if they were uh, residents or not, um, water quality, flooding, and avoiding a theme park feel. So one of the big things that we took away from this survey, and you can see this on the bottom of this graphic here, is that Woodfin residents wanted something more passive and quiet, and then folks that lived outside of Woodfin wanted something a little bit more active. The really good news is the design that we're presenting to you today has both of these elements in it. All right. So uh, Mark Hunt was here tonight, and I'm going to point out Mark because he helped facilitate a visit to Nanahella Outdoor Center. And that was really important because we had folks from the town, we had key stakeholders with the project, we had our entire design team that went down there, and we actually learned some really important lessons from Nanahella Outdoor Center. Some of these are highlighted in this slide here. I'm not going to really read all of them, but one of the things that we kind of were interested to learn was that one out of seven park users, um, only one in seven park users actually get in, in the river. And so that told us that we then had to have amenities for other folks that weren't getting in the river. Spectators, people wanting to watch the people in the river, but also other things to do. Um, we learned a lot from that and we actually implemented that into the 30% design as well. So we did the survey. We went to Nanta Health, Nanta Health Hale Outdoor Center, excuse me. And then we met with the Parks and Advisory Committee. And we um, talked with them and we got some recommendations back from them. And one of those was um, in the master plan, there was a lot of open space and they wanted to make sure that any future designs had a good amount of open space. The other thing was, let's have a greenway that's as wide as possible. So looking at 12 to 14 feet, um, this is gonna be a very popular park. This whole greenway is gonna be very popular and we have to make sure we're accommodating that. Um, and then restrooms and changing facilities, having those two separate. And that's one thing that we learned when we went to Nantahela Outdoor Center. And so that's something we applied to this project as well. As well, when we met with the Parks and Advisory, Advisory Committee, they mentioned a couple other amenities that they would like us to consider in the, in the site plan. And so these are them and all the ones with an asterisk actually were included in what I'm about to walk you through. So here's the site plan. Um, we're going to start on the left. Let's see, do I have a pointer? Nope. Okay. I'll just talk left and right. <laughs> so on the left, I, you're going to be coming off of Riverside Drive into a parking area. And you might be able to see Old Lester Highway. So there's the bridge there. And so that parking area, a little bit different from the master plan in that we were able to expand it a little bit more and take it underneath the bridge. So in our original master plan, we had about 68 spaces. We're looking at about 81 spaces right now. So um, I wanted to point that out because that parking area and then just to the right of the bridge where that box is, um, that's pretty much the old Waste Pro site. And then if you slide all the way down to the right um, where you're seeing the asphalt parking with 39 spaces and a little loop, that's the existing Riverside Park. And we're looking at making improvements to that as well, connecting it with the Greenway system. So back to the parking lot, I'm gonna, we're gonna zoom into that little area that is showing up as a square with dashes. And this is the, the zoom in. So you can see Old Lester Highway on the left side of the image with the parking. We have a drop off area that pulls people into an open plaza. Um, there's a pavilion and uh, across from the pavilion is a restroom and separate changing area. Um, this upper area <coughs> is at the same elevation as the parking lot. And then you're seeing a zigzag line that's going down to the lower plaza. That's a handicap accessible pathway. There's also going to be terracing that happens along this slope. So in this location, we're transitioning from the existing grade down about 10 feet down. And that was part of the process to try to make sure that the wave would work um, with the site and meeting some of the requirements from the, from the flood modeling. Um, back up a little bit higher next to the changing room, kind of in the center, um, there's a circular area. And that's an area for passive um, passive recreational use and then from there going down the slope um, we're using that for natural play area so a culvert slide a, a rock scramble for kids so we're using that grade change and turning it into something that that kids can use and play with so the parents can sit up high they can keep an eye on the river they can keep an eye on their kids they're close to the restroom and the changing room and then you've got this grand pavilion that's situated in a way that could uh, really be um, focused on the river and for 
all the folks that want to watch what's happening with all the people playing in the wave. So you can see the wave kind of in the top right corner. So we're going to now continue down the greenways, the thread through all this, and we're getting into the existing Riverside Park. We are utilizing a lot of the same pathways that are already there. Um, the big change from the master plan to this is that um, we have to work with the regulatory agencies if we're going to get the wave permitted. And we met with them early in the process and we'll continue to meet with them. One of the things they asked of us was to find ways to reduce the number of trees we were going to be taking down. So this design greatly reduces the number of trees that will be taken down. So we're really pleased with that and we think that's going to be a benefit when we go back to the regulatory agencies and we can show them that we listen to them and we minimize impact. So that's very important. The other thing on this plan is the, um, the river access ramp. So this is going to be a pedestrian access and we're not looking at vehicular access. With this new alignment with the greenway, we didn't want to have trailers backing up into the river and having a greenway go through it. That was a safety concern. So we're looking at mostly pedestrian and so we have a way to connect people to the river and give them a bigger area, but it won't be the same as what's going in at Silverline Park right now. So I think that's important for you all to know. Um, this asphalt parking area, we're expanding. A, I think you have approximately 30 spaces right now, so we're looking at improving that to about 39 spaces, so picking up a little bit more parking. Um, the big thing to point out is that there's an existing pavilion there, and um, with this layout, it w it's going to be removed. However, um, we did hear from the Parks and, and Parks and Advisory Committee that they really wanted us, they really wanted us to put something back in place. So we're actually showing that. And if I had a pointer, you can see potential pavilions actually um, located on here. So we were able to add that back. Um, the big thing here too is there's a loop drive, and then there's trailer parking spaces, so people can actually pull in trailers, unload some of the boats, and then they can they can move on. So. This is kind of the layout right now. Um, ADA ac access is an important component, and we also, we're also providing that down in this lower portion of the park as well. So a few um, details. So this is what the restroom and changing uh, room would look like. You have the changing areas on one side. It's connected with a roof with a breezeway, and the restrooms are separate. And then we have an image. Um, so the image to the right is the restroom and changing room. And then the image on your left is the pavilion. So now I'm going to transition. Um, I did not mention that S2O, they are designing the wave. And they weren't able to be here tonight. So I'm just going to briefly touch on, on this. Um, and what you're looking at with this image is, again, the park is on the right. If I had a little pointer, I'd point to it. But in the center of the river, you can kind of see these, these circular shapes. That's the area where the wave's going to be, and that's kind of the, the design with the topography and how they're going to change that. The, what you're seeing on the left in the river is a, is a bypass, and that's for fish and also for boaters and tubers or anyone else who doesn't want to go through the wave. So there's a way for them to safely get around. So that's really important. S2O has been working very hard to reach a no-rise condition. It's as part of the flood modeling that they're doing. Um, that has big implications. They were able to achieve that. However, they went and talked with the county flood administrator, and, and he did say that they were going to have to go through a CLOMAR process. So that's condition, conditional letter of map revision. It just means it's going to add some time, unfortunately. Um, we had to do it with Silverline Park, so we've gone through the process. It, it's, it's possible, so we'll get through it. Um, but the good news on the timing is we had a big window for permitting and we think we're going to not have to extend the, the length of the project of what we've proposed. All right, so some for those of you who are really interested in flood modeling, here's a graphic for you that shows, it actually shows the bypass on the left, the little blue area, and the area that's kind of dropping down is the wave. And this is just kind of a model that kind of shows it a little bit, if you can perceive this. Um, this is just... Um, kind of an overlay with topography. All right, and now we're getting into schedule because everyone always wants to know where we are with the schedule. <laughs> we're, um, we're in pretty good shape. I think we're about a month behind right at this particular moment, but I, I feel very confident we'll be able to catch up. Um, 
we are in the 30%. We've, we have this design ready. We're working on the cost estimates. If we get the go ahead, we're moving directly into 60% design. 60% design we plan to have complete in April. At that point in time, we plan to have an online public event. And so that's something that we're working towards. We're also gonna come back to you. We're gonna also go back to the Park and Advisory Committee. If you approve that, we wanna bring you along with steps. We don't wanna to get to the very end and say, you don't like it or you want a lot of changes because that's not good for anybody in, the, in this design process and it's gonna take time and more resources. So we're trying to go incrementally and then so once we get to April, we come back. Then we come back in August, hopefully with the final plan set. You give the thumbs up and then we start on our permitting. Permitting is the wild card. Now there's land disturbance permitting and erosion control permitting. That we're, that we can probably, we, we know the time frame for that, but we're talking about permitting with the Army Corps of Engineers with the WAVE. That just takes a little bit more time. It's hard to accurately predict how long it's gonna take. But again, we've been working with them. We're gonna meet with them at the 30, we've already met with, actually we've already met with them. We're gonna meet with them, share the 30%, share the 60% design, and all the way, hopefully they're gonna let us know if they see any red flags so we can address them as we're going. So that's the intent. Um, I did not point out that what you're looking at on this table is the top part of the table is the design and engineering schedule. And the bottom part is the estimated construction schedule. It's an estimate. Um, we hope we can do better than this. We hope that we can go to construction before the fall of 2023, um, but um, you can see that we have the bat moratorium and, and hurricane season on here because we wanted to show you things that we have to work around. Um, so this is a real realistic schedule um, that we wanted to put in front of you. And um, like I said, we think um, if everything goes really well, we'll be able to be in front of this. Um, I know I went through this fast and I realize I'm talking fast because I'm really excited about this project, so I apologize. Um, are folks allowed to ask questions, Eric? Is that okay or? The mayor's meeting, so. Okay, I'm mayor, sure. is it okay? <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. Okay. And if there's no questions, that's great. It's an, it's an amazing project. Any questions? One thing as you go forward with this is making sure the community is aware. It's like we've got the tree houses up here. We donated, you know, for raffles and different things for this. But we'll do a lot more. And I know there's other people in the community will, will do a lot more. It's it's really a, a getting the message out there because I think a lot of people have missed it. They, they want to contribute. They want to do more. And I think you'll find a lot of like-minded individuals that are excited about this same project. So that's great. That's great. Be on the lookout because that, that public event that we want to do, it's, it's, we're, we're planning for it to be online, but we're, we're trying to make sure that that could be communicated really well and there could be videos and a lot more information on the design process. So I'm hoping that will be a time where we can really get it out into the community even more than we have been. Perfect. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. So you'll let me know if we get the go ahead so we can start on 60% design. I think that's what David needs tonight is, is, a, is a, well, I don't know if it's a formal vote, but I think it would be a vote to proceed to be what we would look for to, um, to give them the green light then to move forward in the next step of the process and refine the cost estimates and maybe work toward a 60% design based on the concept that you've seen tonight. Okay, I need to make that a motion. I think you do. I'll make the motion that we proceed with the 60% design. I'll second. Okay, have a motion of two seconds. <laughs> have any discussion? <laughs> All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you very much. We'll start working on it. Okay, next item is consideration of a petition for acceptance of private streets into the municipal street system from Olivet Subdivision. <laughs> Luke, I think you're handling that. Yes, sir. Let's see what is it. Good evening, folks. Luke Williams. Um, 
here to talk about, provide a little bit of background here. Um, this started actually um, in, back in July when Olivet and Riverside Community and Farm requested acceptance of several streets uh, for, the, for the town's consideration to be uh, accepted. So at that time, uh, staff engaged McGill Engineering to perform evaluation of the roads to determine adherence to the DOT standards. During that time, we found a letter of, uh, during that due diligence period, we found a letter of acceptance that dated back to 2016. However, at that time, none of the roads were specifically indicated. And so because of that, we were, and the, the motion that was brought up is that's the main reason why we're bringing it up again today um, because just to do the, have it uh, properly done. So this, the town staff is requesting the town board to consider formally accepting the following name roads. And there are a couple conditions that I'll go over in just a minute. So we've got all that crossing parkway. If you look on the screen, kind of highlighted the ones in green are the ones we're looking at, um, wanting to be accepted and the ones in red as no. So it's all that crossing parkway, sweet fern parkway, tulip poplar trail, bee bomb way, river run, French broad river way, Tupelo trail, cross vine alley, Wilma Dykeman trail, and Westridge farm road. So some of the conditions that we had talked with the developer and based on the engineer's report <coughs> was there were some um, asphalt curbing, which is that doesn't necessarily meet DOT standards. And so he has agreed um, that any curbing, repair, or replacement that's needed will be handled by the subdivision or the developer or the HOA. The other aspect is um, there's a lot of new development occurring along Westridge Farm Road. The road is done, but when you have new development, you have the, op the opportunity for um, damage to the road. And so we're going to put in... He's agreed to put an amend the covenant that any um, construction damage will be handled by them. Two things, too, that we recommend not accepting is ownership of the bridges as well as um, May Apple Bridge Road. I can go into a little bit more detail, but at this time, we're not ready to recommend acceptance of that. With that, are there any questions? In a nutshell, <clears throat> the one road, is it a basic problem? Is it a lot of little things, or are you prepared to say? Just curious. You may want Scott to yeah, answer that first. Yeah, Scott's here to, um, my understanding, it, it was a, it originally intended as a construction road entrance. So there, there's a couple of items on there that we probably want to see beefed up, of, I guess, as a matter right, of speaking. Uh, I don't think there's any Questions? How many bridges? Ownership of it. How many bridges are doing that? There yeah. were two. Two bridges. Two bridges. Any further comments? Okay, so you need a motion to accept. I'll, I'll make a motion that the town approve the developer's petition for acceptance of private streets in the midst Municipality Street System for all of its subdivision. And I'm going to name these streets, Luke, like you did. The Olivet Crossing Parkway, Sweet Fern Parkway, Tulip Poplar Trail, Bee Bomb Way, River Run, French Broad River Way, Tupelo Trail, Cross Vine Alley, Wilhelmina Dykeman Trail, and West Ridge Farm Road. Okay, you've heard a motion. We have a second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? 
Do we do we need in the motion the specific exclusion of the bridges? That would be helpful. I think it would be wise to do that. And then Commissioner Lunsford, if, if I can offer a friendly amendment to your motion to, to clarify that we are accepting the streets you named, excluding any bridges located within the subdivision. Okay. What about that other construction road? Yeah. Well, he didn't He didn't name that road, so I think that's already out. Already on the motion. Do I need to add that except? You, you can accept you, his. If you accept my friendly motion, it's in there. So you accept his, you accept his? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's so amended. So the amended motion okay. now includes that. Okay. So you've heard the motion in a second. Any further discussion? Mike? So, Mayor, not by Alan, but Tom made a strong statement, but I'm just curious. So by you, by the board accepting these roads, what, what does that, what, so I guess, thinking about it with the money and I'm a taxpayer. So what does that mean? Does that mean every time there's a pothole that that we're repairing those potholes? What what is that? I'd like to know the expectation from all the vets on, on what you're asking for. And and I think the board needs to know what, what are what are the expectations from the board for repairing these roads. So I'm happy to speak for myself. When we when we annex that property, there's mm -hmm. a requirement of North Carolina law that we extend the same level of services that exist in the town to the new annexed area to the extent that which and maintain the roads within the town as it existed prior to this annexation. We've got the same obligation to maintain roads in the new section, assuming they meet certain standards. In return for that, the state gives us funding based on the length of those roads. But yes, we would be obligated to maintain them going forward. But there'd be that offset from the Powell Bill funds that would come from the state. So, so does that mean, like, just to be clear, if next year there's five potholes, big <laughs> potholes up here, because I'm trying to get any number of issues that come up, does that mean that, that is all of that expected those five potholes to be paved, and is Woodson paying to pay those potholes? So I can speak to this, Frank. Um, what Mr. Edgerton said was to the extent that the town improves other streets and repairs other streets, the same uh, plan, these streets would fall into that same program. Okay. So to the extent that the town has right. sufficient funds is how far that gets, and so you know how that goes. Yep. So it's the yep. same. It's no different, no differentiation. Thank you. But but the town has done a thorough inspection and is satisfied that those roads will be as easy to maintain as any other woods and roads. The, the, the town and, and Miguel. Tell them, yes. you know, we've hired an engineer to go and uh, the developer has an engineer, and then we have an engineer also go out and confirm that, and then we all consulted together. Um, and you know, the, the, what's not been said is that this development was in bankruptcy. This the pr previous development was in bankruptcy, and this developer purchased it out of that, and then proceeded to develop um, to what we see today. And um, so that's what we've got, and that's what he inherited, and the town accepted for annexation. More than answers the question you asked. It does. Thank you for that. Okay. Any further comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. Next up is the street paving project. Uh, thank you. That was a really good lead with segue into how we determine which roads to go after. Um, so part of that, you'll be able to, uh, Tom Menino from McGill is here. If you want to come on up, I'll introduce him. We've entertained, uh, Town of Woodfin and McGill has um, entered into kind of a MSA contract with them as the engineer record for us. And so they're here helping us develop uh, the street paving project. Um, I know, Eric, if you were planning to give some of the background or do, would you like me to go into that? Um, not necessarily. I think part of covers that. I'll close it up with costs and how we pay for it. Got it. <laughs> Good evening, <clears throat> members of the board. I'm Thomas Menino from McGill Associates, a professional engineer overseeing the street resurfacing project, plan development, and construction documents for you all to execute, uh, hopefully in the near future. Uh, if I just click this, yeah. next slide. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Next brief intro. So uh, our, currently our scope is covering 26 residential streets um, that the town has identified uh, for resurfacing. Uh, they, 
the, the town is also advised that um, we proceed with resurfacing the worst condition roadways first. The selection was based on the 2020 pavement condition survey that was conducted by uh, Dan Teague. Um, <coughs> and they rated the ro all the roadways which the town owns on a, a hundred scale. Uh, the roadways selected will capture all the town roads below the 60 rating and this will significantly improve the town's rating overall and it'll bring it in the, the low 70s well, once you average them all out. A couple standard uh, typical photos of what some of these lower than 60 rated um, roadways look like. As you can see, we have some roadway failures adjacent to an inlet shown over here, pretty rough conditions. Uh, with every rain event, you're getting significant erosion and we're looking to patch that up. Um, that will pretty much be a full removal and replacement of the asphalt surface. Uh, on the right hand side, you see some significant alligator cracking across the entire roadway surface. Um, so that would also require essentially a full asphalt removal <coughs> and replacement. Um, otherwise, to just mill and resurface would most likely reflect those cracks through the new asphalt surface. So in it, uh, to give you a, a solid finished product, you know, that looks like a brand new roadway, we're going to have to take those out in its entirety. Give you another photo of some more minor alligator cracking. Um, we can uh, do a inch and a half mill and then a sealant over the top with an overlay, which will um, fill most of those voids and then prevent any reflection cracking from coming through the new surface. And then there's also a number of roadways which are in okay shape, but you know they have a number of patches uh, from repairs or, or spot spot fills and potholes. And so we would uh, we'll be proposing to just do a inch and a half mill sealant and another inch and a half overlay. That way your roadway surface will be at the the finished roadway will be at its current surface today. So there shouldn't be any dramatic issues with pavement, driveway connections, connecting to existing asphalt or roadways. And hopefully at the end of the day, this is what it will look like. We have brand new paved roadways, nice and smooth transition. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll uh, condition the rock before putting down new asphalt over top. And that way we'll have a nice smooth paved surface, you know, continuous and, and uh, no jagged edges. Here's a general map of the roads that we're targeting, the 26. Uh, you can see they're pretty scattered about mm -hmm. town. Uh, and as I said before, it's all based on the rating. So uh, we're going to go after the worst rated roadways first, which typically are going to be the ones that are going to need full, full replacement. Um, with a full replacement roadway and in the worst condition, uh, whether it be age, those typically have failed because of um, subsurface issues and not just over longevity and, and life. So we do expect there to be some um, undercut and base rock, uh, stone base and sub base improvements to be addressed along the way. And those will be handled, you know, during construction, we are doing a pavement core analysis to uh, verify that the existing stone beneath is going to meet our DOT criteria and also do some sampling below for the subgrade to make sure that it's suitable and that way we don't run into any unforeseen issues once the contractor gets out there. Hopefully this will prevent any large issues that would arise that were unforeseen at the get-go. Um, we're essentially, uh, we've begun the development of the construction plan and we're essentially at about 65% complete through developing the plans. We've done our uh, <coughs> field work and we have it drafted up. Um, <coughs> I'm awaiting the execution of, of the pavement core analysis to incorporate. Um, we've done, a, we've updated our preliminary cost estimate to include um, 
to, it doesn't include the subsurface findings because we haven't gotten that report back yet. However, uh, our estimate is about two and a half million at the time, and we have some extra, uh, we're planning on some extra money to come in to address any of those subsurface issues. So you say that on some of these, you don't know what, that, that you don't know that there might not be underlying problems, things like hidden springs. You don't know that yet on all of these? Well, any, anything that would be obvious, you know, like a hidden spring that would, that would show itself in a divot or a dip or a, a pothole developing or a patch that's been that's sinking further. Same with like a failed drainage pipe would typically, you know, with the migration of the subsurface soils, it'll create a, a dip there. I live near Lake Town Lane and that's notorious. So is that an example of one that you know what's underneath there or is that data yet to come? Uh, well, essentially that data would be yet to, yet to come, but any, any glaring issues, you know, that we would be able to tell from the surface we, we've captured. Okay. Of course, I was actually out there today and I, I was, uh, verifying our plan and I, I found somebody that had a, a leaking water service that was bubbling <laughs> straight up through the asphalt. And uh, <laughs> I had a nice little conversation with him. That's <laughs> not a spring. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a spring. <laughs> um, so essentially, that's the majority of the scope. Uh, here's our my brief timeline. Um, we've performed our evaluation on site, uh, and it, it's complete at this time. We're developing the plans. We anticipate bidding uh, for mid-January to have the contract documents finished. Um, we anticipate the award and contract execution to be um, in mid-February. This will be pending the uh, when we get the results of that uh, pavement core analysis in order to incorporate that to meet the January deadline, so to speak. Um, so the February 15th isn't essentially hard date, but that's our forecast and we're going to do our best to, to meet that. Um, and then we anticipate being able to have the plans developed, put out to bid so the contractors can have them in their hands, you know, during slow season. And that way, hopefully we can get you the best price uh, on the street available. And as we all know, with cost escalation and the cost of materials these days, it's pretty hard to pin down. So we've done our, our best to uh, not be the low bidder in our estimates and capture uh, pricing based on our most recent projects that we've also done. And um, so that way we, could, we can pin, pin down your final cost. And in anticipation that we could have a, a contract executed for construction sometime in March Ju to June and hopefully giving the contractor a little flexibility. That way he would be a little more amenable to a competitive price. That's my brief uh, overview. Anybody have any questions or uh, specifics? talk about uh, the money side. So what we're proposing, um, and we've, we briefed the members of the board a couple of times prior to this. So we started back last spring and during budget cycle. Um, and then most recently when we were talking with the new commissioners and giving them briefings on the operational matters that will be coming before the board, this is one of those. It's a material item. So this, this represents a major step up in investment by the town in the town's roads. Um, I come from the school that says you take care of what you've got. I know we're adding more streets. We're adding good streets, streets in good repair. Um, so we take care of what we've got um, before we really begin to, to do other things. Um, and so that's what this represents. And so the, the, the three million dollars, uh, looking at this more from a financial fe feasibility point of view, starting there, but the way that we get there is, um, as Commissioner Edgerton mentioned earlier, the PAL bill, so this is a gasoline tax. A portion of that come, is returned to the town every year, a couple of distributions. Um, and we have in our reserves currently about $250,000. We want to spend 220 of that. And there's very specific ways that you can spend that money. So it's not necessarily discretionary, um, but it has to be used for street operations and repairs. And repairs is what we need to focus on right now. 
uh, in our recommendation. In the current year, our finance officer tells us that we will be in receipt of $190,000, and so we're projecting that next year we'll receive the same. And so then that leaves us with a gap, and so that's what we intend to go get a bank loan um, or some other type of financing, but primarily I think the, the logical uh, direction would be a bank loan to, to fund the rest of that. And so we've talked with our financial advisors just to let them know that we may be coming back to talk with them. I've got a note here that to borrow $2.4 million in today's uh, environment for 15 years is about $225,000 per year. <coughs> Historically, the town had only invested about $200,000, and that was the power bill money. <coughs> so what we're talking about going forward is a step up. So, so the overall plan would be to continue to spend that power bill money as we receive it, but then we have this debt service to layer over that. <coughs> Once we get through this project and what – what Thomas told us was the $3 million is what we're going to shoot for is our cap. We, he gave us a list of streets that we hope that will be considered, so it will be part of the bidding package. Give us your pricing on these. To the extent that we have the money within $3 million, we will pave those roads in the sequence in the order they are indicated by the scoring. That, that list may be ambitious, and we'll know that in short order. Um, and so as Thomas said, he's estimated about 2.5 preliminarily, but they've not been with the borings yet to know what's under the, the surfaces uh, of the streets. And so that's why we're saying we're going to cap it at $3 million in this recommendation for this amount uh, of money um, in investment. So uh, once we finish with this, we'll assess where we are and we come back with the plan then to begin to address the other uh, backlog of deferred maintenance on, on town streets. Uh, Luke and Johnny and I have rode around together and looked at the streets that are on this list. We feel confident that this is the right list to work on first. Um, there are pockets of disrepair, potholes. We all see them. We all know them on many other streets. So this is a beginning um, as a step up. So it's not the end. And so from, from you, what we would like is the nod, the agreement to proceed. Uh, the formal action to the board uh, would be to bring back to you a contract to award once all the bids are tabulated. And uh, McGill will help us do that process. Incidentally, McGill also has a similar type of transportation improvement plan. They work with the town of Fletcher and others in the region too. So they bring a lot of expertise to this particular project and to the town, which I, our public works director has been very much advocating for. And um, so staff is all aligned behind this plan and we hope that uh, we'll get a approval to proceed from you. And that's that, unless you have questions for me on the financing or process. One, sure. one request, um, I don't think this information is available yet, but there's a line item in the federal infrastructure bill that just passed that will allocate 400 million to North Carolina uh, for street maintenance. Yes, sir. I don't think there's a more detailed breakdown on, in terms of what Woodfin specifically might receive, but I would ask that town staff get in touch with the School of Government. I think it's probably probably care at the school of government is the right person to get in touch with just so that they know that we are interested in in hearing what we might be receiving as soon as they know just so we have that information as as early as possible yes, just in case we don't end up needing to to take on anywhere near the debt that we're talking about you know i think in talking with the finance officer she's advised that we wait to, to finance this as long as possible so that we can so if something changes and we get more specificity to that federal funding, that's what we would, would want to latch onto first. Okay. So to your point, so thank you for, for, Excellent. Thank for, you. for mentioning that. You're, um, we're lining up right behind what you just said. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so we will, if you all agree to this, uh, he will bring back to you, the finance officer will bring back to you next month a reimbursement resolution, which means we can go ahead and spend the money. And then if we need to borrow the money, we can use that money to reimburse ourselves. It's not, it's not a commitment to borrow the money. So we always we retain that flexibility. So we want to maintain as much flexibility for you all as possible, and that's our goal uh, in, in working through this. Okay, I'll entertain a motion that we uh, allow them to proceed with this project. I'll move that. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Yes, Okay, I need to back up a little bit. Yes. I omitted Walt. Walt, I apologize. But we'll hear your uh, uh, advisory committee recommendation for parks and greenways. Uh, my name's Walt Brewer. I haven't met a couple of you guys. Um, I, I really don't think that there's much to say uh, because uh, here's a copy. 
um, the uh, advisory committee did review the uh, uh, the 30% plan. We're really enthusiastic about it. We um, did have a couple of uh, comments to raise. One of them, uh, Equinox has already addressed. That is trying to add back a pavilion for the one that's being removed. Uh, we request that the uh, uh, the uh, toilets that are going to remain be upfitted, and other than that, we reserve the right to sort of review any of our recommendations based on cost estimates once they're in. But beyond that, we you know, enthusiastically uh, support what you all have already done. Thank you. Okay. Do you need a <coughs> recommendation from us, or uh, is that just we were just going to recommend that you. Okay. Yeah, we're going to take about a five-minute break. making our way through this agenda pretty well. I, I feel like we're making our way through this lengthy agenda really well. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. It just background stuff that I could that I could have found online, which is fine. That's right. I know this is amazing. Oh. Nice. Jonathan Gilbert, this is Eric Hardy, town administrator. Yes. Zero. Now, did you just get here? One of the key things components are the recognize anybody with these derm masks. And so, if I can just get to the what we don't know is, is the state going to have some patches? We don't know. Well, it's not announced. They haven't announced it yet. But they, so, I know they have to be some April and April will be the place yep. between the commission and that. Yeah. So she had to be still be yeah. yeah. But I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know the other members. Extends all the way down to the Bridge Road, but that's just a little, that's another quarter of a mile. We're still talking about a large amount of, of, of space, which is unbelievable. Yeah. The town is going to be uh, starting on a comprehensive planning uh, for the street, and so sidewalks are going to be on that process as a priority. Yeah, uh, 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 moving away from the carbon base to. Uh, 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 I didn't know where. I didn't know where. 
I'm like, sir, I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, those years gone. First day of winter, which is most of our traffic. First day of winter, man. Winter solstice. I don't disagree with you. I think it has to be a priority for the residents. This is the resolution to accept the grant that we've got. We have a sidewalk plan that's several years old. We're behind the wall on a plane, obviously. So, out of curiosity, I have a time for the city square. And then, what about the new building? That's the budget amendment of the city hall. So, every, you know, after a while, I'll see the rest of the city hall. And I think that's why we don't have it in Woodson. Now, you're going to write this renovation like on Baird Cove Road. And let me, Eric, let me just put a sidewalk. Do you have the Jerry Potter before? Yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay, yeah, I have yet to familiarize myself with our legal support and who does what. Yeah. But I'm just doing a, a special project just on planning. I don't get into any of the other stuff. This is mm -hmm. no, I haven't seen those at all. Uh, yeah, arena, uh, language planning, and that's the it's on the Okay. Huh. It's on a special contract. I overwrote the uh, So, are you working on specific projects for, in Woodfield? Uh, sort of. On our, is that a silly question? No, it's just because it. Zoning appeals? Uh-huh. I see. Okay. Well, I'm glad to know that. I'm just making my way through you know, all this stuff. I, I appreciate that. I actually, uh, somebody asked me why I was running, and I said, because I've lost my mind. <laughs> But it's, it's a, it's really a, But uh, we all have a part to play. And, 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 and uh, all, all the, 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 yes, that is absolutely true. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, you know, I'm glad that you all took a step up. But I would, but I don't think I'm going to live. My office is actually, I live in Saluda, actually. Oh, okay. So, but my office at Kiyos has been in Ashford. Well, how long have you been associated with Wood Pen? Just a legal capacity. Since when? August. Oh, okay. Not very long. No, you know, some of these things have come up and now. Yeah, we've had some. Dying down. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for I'm your out. part in that. It's a safe So I guess you didn't want to do it. No. <laughs> He's got, he's got two best mates. Like One's his gavel and the other one is cell phone going on. Like and the cell phone goes off there and makes the internet explode. That's two of his best mates. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's hit that thing before so hard. I, I can't believe it. Well, you know, I was just thinking about it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're still here. Yeah. 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 So I'll, I'll be looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One time I jumped about that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, it is loud. <laughs> 
Call the meeting back to order. Uh, let's see. Next item is a public hearing on amendments to zoning and subdivision ordinances, including 160D and uh, uh, Avery. You skipped two items, I think. Huh? You skipped two items, I think. That's all we've got. But you've got a form of sequence on the agenda. That's not my agenda. Yeah, that's next on mine. So Walnut Springs Drive is what you're on? Okay. Okay, we're going to talk about a public hearing, the rezoning for property located at uh, Walnut Springs Drive, the Springs, further identified to lots 4A, 4B, 4C, 6A, 6B, and 6C is shown on flat book 114 at page 100, except in the western portion of lot 4A, not owned by the applicant, so on and so forth. So, Anyway, Adrian, it's up to you. <laughs> I had some, just full disclaimer, I had some PowerPoint slides for this, but they disappeared. So um, the plats are in your packet if you want to, if that's what they were, that's all they were. So um, the developer is here. I want to point that out. If you have any questions for him, um, maybe more so on the next item. But I just wanted to give you a little background on the request. Um, so in 2007, Phase one of a phase development plan known as Waterstone Place was approved for 25 townhomes on this approximately 30 acre parcel. Um, construction started on those townhomes and the downturn of 2008 happened, so only 19 of the 25 homes were constructed. Um, several years later, that, that developer sold the property to another development group. Um, so in 2019, that development group came and asked for rezoning um, from R7 to Mountain Village. Um, the majority of the parcel was, um, well, all the parcel was owned R7. They requested Mountain Village. But the zoning plan of that approval did not include the additional six lots that were uh, platted for the original subdivision, the original townhome development. They then came through and got a approval of a master plan um, for 198 units, I believe, I, and, um, and then turned around and sold it to a third development group. Well, that development group came in and recommended, uh, was asking for approval to change the <coughs> six lot area of their original um, 25 home Sub, uh, townhome development to 12 lots. 
that uh, division was approved. The plat that it was approved on incorrectly labeled that area as Zone Mountain Village. Um, they also requested amendment to the original master plan that was approved by the second development group um, that was approved administratively, should not have been. So that plot has been rescinded. The request before you tonight is to rezone that six lot area from R7 to Mountain Village. Um, and this agenda item, the next agenda item is amendment to the master plan. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, the Planning and Zoning Board of Adjustment reviewed this and uh, recommends approval based on consistency with the current principle of plan, goals of Uh, land use goal one, pursue compatible infill development in order to actively promote appropriate development and redevelopment. And land use goal, land use goal one, objective one. And then land use goal one, objective three, increase density around transportation corridors in accordance with pedestrian and transit oriented development standards. Um, that written statement is in your packet and you also have a consistency statement for review um, in your deliberation and, dis and decision. So that's what I have, unless you have any questions for me or the developer. Will the developer be given a chance to uh, present on this? Yes. Okay. You want to speak now? Yeah, My name is David Dupree. I'm with NSR Woodfin. We own the property. For many of you, this will be deja vu all over again. Uh, and I'll, I'll back up and sort of tell you what I, what I know about the property, and, and, and Adrian has been dynamite, as the staff has to work with. But in your packet, the first document you'll see is a board meeting of May 19th, 2020. And at that board meeting on the back side of that page, you'll see where this very property was brought up and was approved by this board. Uh, not this board, but the board, <laughs> to be um, Mountain Village. Subsequently, within just a few weeks, maybe go ahead and get me, um, we, we put the property under contract um, from Stars and Stripes. That was one of the other things that happened along the way. I think there was some confusion about who we were and who they were. We actually are the, we own the property today, NSR Woodfin, and we have our own building company called Madison Simmons Homes that we will be building on the property. So there won't be any more he said, she said. It'll be David Dupree's fault if there's a problem. And that's what we're here to take responsibility for. So before we bought it, though, I went to Michael Saunders, who was on the staff at that point, and I asked him to send me the approved plan. And the second page of your document is exactly what he sent me. And my response back in the email was, is this it? And he said, yes. And if you'll notice on that plan, it has the lots which are in question tonight, the six lots labeled as Mountain Village, along with the subsequent property, uh, which, may, which encompasses what we purchased. So at this point, David Dupree thought he was buying a property that was already zoned Mountain Village. So we immediately went to Michael and said, okay, can we have the capacity because of the footprint of the property that we build, may we change that footprint from six lots to 10 lots. I think Adrian said 12, but it was actually 10. He then says, yes, you may, David, and I have for you as the third page of your document a recorded plat from the town of Woodfin saying that I may build these 10 lots. So we then, I say, we, we, the per property was purchased. We submitted all of our uh, construction plans to begin construction on the infrastructure of the site. It, you may have been out there. It, it had partial curb. It had some sewer. It was just a little bit of a mess. Along the way, the neighbors, who no one's here tonight, we have, uh, we did, I'm sorry, we did a, a fairly poor job of communicating with the neighbors early on in this process, and I think they thought we were still stars and stripe, the original developer. We've tried to do a much better job of communicating what we're trying to build and who we are and what we're doing. I think we have set up now uh, weekly or at least every two weeks meeting with the HOA president and vice president on the site. So everybody's very aware of what we're trying to accomplish. So we, we then got our, all of our construction plans approved and we began moving dirt with the anticipation that we were gonna build our new units. And uh, the, the, if you look, this is a, a new design of basically what we're planning to build on those two 
now we hope to be 10 lot units adjacent to the current 19 they're building. Yes, sir. And will you clarify once and for all exactly how many you're going to build? Yeah, we have the right per what we hope in this master plan to build 120 total townhomes on this site. And at the third, the, the, the actual master plan we have here actually shows that. It'll show what we're going to build. And we're going to build three different product types because of the topography of the land and uh, what we believe the demographic is going to be in here. We're going to have a, a master down product that will have an alley fed garage. That's why you'll see we've elongated some of the lots. We've also eliminated what was going to be a pocket park in the original plan, and we've moved it down to the end of the property uh, to make things hopefully a little bit more efficient. Uh, you can see that this area, this pond, we've actually eliminated as well because it was a, uh, actually, uh, what was it classified? The dam was classified as uh, uh, dangerous infrastructure, and we went in, we didn't know we were going to do this, so we removed it to eliminate any potential downstream flooding and, and have all that. That's all been eliminated now, so we've actually got a much larger, about a three-acre parcel there that can be the park. And wh why we wanted to eliminate the pocket park was what happens is when you have people who back up to a park, they tend to want to own it. And they tend to want the HOA to spend a lot of money on it. And they want it to be their backyard. And other folks don't want to go in the backyard and sit at a park where somebody's sitting on their back deck looking at them. So we felt like by making it a larger area and moving it down the street, there'd be more of an opportunity for people to use it. Uh, and that's why we've moved the park down the street. That was one of the questions some folks had for us. But in our master plan, you can see we have a, uh, a, a elongated product, which would be a master down alley fed uh, two story product. And then uh, in your packet here, you'll also see, though you don't see it as a three story product, this actually is a third story that's underground that'll be fed from the back of the alley because of the topography. And then the same unit will be built again with the garage on the front of it at the very end of the street because of the topography. So we have three different product types. They'll range anywhere from about, oh, 1,500 to about 2,000 square feet in size. And the price points will range around 350 to four and a quarter is what we're anticipating right now. Uh, and we're trying to bring some, one of the things the neighbors had asked us to do is on that six, uh, on the parcel that was adjacent to the 19 that were built, they had asked us to build the same product that they currently have on those 19. And unfortunately, in their current zoning today, we couldn't build that product either. It, was not, it would not meet those zoning classifications. So that's why we're asking you to rezone the whole thing to Mountain Village so we can move on down the road and, and put the product in that we hope to have. Um, we've updated some things on the product. This is a product we've been successful with. We're, we're just down the road in uh, Lake Norman, so we're only a couple hours away. We're excited to be here. I love seeing things like the, the Riverside Park and working on streets. Most of the time when I get to places like this, it's, it's arguing over stuff versus making things better. So I'm excited that maybe we get a, be one of the first folks into the door to build some new products in the Woodfin. Um, we're working on things like Costco closets, crazy term, where you have enough room to put bulk toilet paper or bulk paper towels because people are now doing that, things that you don't see in townhomes from the past. We're looking at making sure there's outlets in the garage so that if you happen to use a hybrid car, you have a place to plug it in. Uh, and we're seeing all those type of things that we're trying to incorporate and bring some new stuff into Woodfin. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, we're, we're excited to be here. I, I want to get this behind me. We had planned to break ground in October, try to beat the weather and get our first uh, 10 units out of the ground. So if we can get this done, I've, I've got a, a contractor, a, a, a GC who works for me, already ready to move his family up here to get started. <laughs> so uh, he's been waiting. I said, we'll just celebrate Christmas here and we'll, we'll maybe get started in January. So. Uh, so any questions, we, I'd love to answer them. Like I said, we will be, the buck will stop with us. We will not only do the infrastructure, which if you're out there today, you'll see we have begun that work, uh, but we also will actually build the units and sell them. Any questions? I got one. We've got a public hearing. Let's have a public hearing. Yeah, we've got a public hearing coming up. If you want to speak it here. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I'll be, that's fine. So I'll be glad to answer them. Anybody from the, from the board got any questions, comments? I would, I, this is my third rodeo with Mr. Dupree. I was on planning and zoning when we first this place. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, we kind of stumbled a little bit, but um, this is an awesome project in my opinion. So I, I do look forward to hearing from the neighbors and others. I'll be right here if you need me. Thank you very much. Okay. Where are we? Which one of these, Eric? The one above. The one above.
one that Ryan handed you. You can toss the one that I handed you. Can you use the one that... Okay, so anyhow, we're down to number five for the public hearing. Is that correct? I see something about this. Okay. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to open the public hearing and, and uh, in just a minute on rezoning for a property located at Walnut Springs Drive. Uh, the Springs and further identified as lots 4A, 4B, 4C, 6A, 6B, and 6C as shown on flat book 114 to page 100. Except in the western portion of lot 4A, not owned by the applicant, as shown on flat book 218 at page 167. See also flat book 130 at page 86 and flat book 156 at page 174 from R7 to Mountain Village. Adrian, do you have any comments before I open the public hearing? No. Okay, I'll open this public hearing at 8, uh, 808. PM. Does anyone wish to speak? Come up and identify yourself. I'm Jim Weber and I live on uh, Mountain Glen Drive. You know, a lot's taken place the last 19 years that I've been there since this project is on off, on off. My big question and our neighbor's question is, initially we talked about putting a tree line buffer between the property edge, which would be the east of Mountain Glen, our properties, and this development. That would be the only question I'd ask this fellow here if that's still in the works. Uh, I am not aware of the tree buffer, any, any buffers beyond what's required by the ordinance going in. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to ask that question ever. I'm not aware of it. Well, Is that back, the original yeah, a couple of years back, I mean, I've been coming here pretty regularly, so there was a, there was talk. You know, my property is, is is the second house off of Old Marshall Highway. I'm okay, pretty much, but everybody from that point on, all they do is see the development, and the development is going to be okay. I mean, I think it's the, the right thing to do. You know, it's progress. It's it's what has to happen. I just wish it would have got done sooner. Yeah, right. I, I understand yeah. the financial piece of it. But there was conversation that there was going to be a, a tree line buffer installed right at the edge of the property. Right, right now, if you where your infrastructure is, I watch it every day. Yeah, you do see it. Yeah. Every single day, I watch it. Where the infrastructure is and the property edges where they made the road and it goes into our property area, there was supposed to be a tree buffer installed there. And yeah. somewhere in my minutes or notes, it was there. And that was way before we got into this mountain. That, that's my question, and that's the question of our neighbor. There's eight homes there. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, and, and I was not a part of the original rezone that happened in 2020, uh, according to that plan. And when I did receive what I was to receive to say this is what was rezoned, y'all see it. <laughs> and that was it. So well, I don't think it even was really just not, not any substance to the rezoning other than here's what it is. So I have no, and Adrian, I don't know that you have any record of that, do you? Yeah, I, I don't know if anyone has that. I mean, there was it really a, doesn't mean we can't sit down and talk. Perhaps we can share a bucket together or work together on it or whatever. I mean, there was even a conversation that the lady is up with her houses at the very end. They were going to put a wall up on that, on that end of the property to break some of the, the look, I guess, if you would. Of the development, so yeah, and uh, yeah, we can talk. I mean, <laughs> but that—that's the big issue right now. I mean, when they start knocking all the trees down, I mean, you know, the surveys were there on a Friday, Saturday, they were poking the sticks in the ground, and Monday the bulldozers were there. You know, so yeah. So that's my only question. Yeah, I, I go back and look at it. Try to find it. I'll look for it. And, and I don't know that, it, unfortunately or fortunately, if it's relevant today anyhow, because it wasn't approved at that point, I don't, I don't have any bearing, but we certainly want to be a good neighbor. So if there's something we can sit down and chat about, a way to, to make, but I don't know that our folks want to look at the back of your house either. So there may be a natural creation there. Well, sure. Table. 
the and then we're supposed to raise up together and, and, and uh, hold hands and move on down the road. So, yeah, I don't think that's out of the realm. And certainly love to get your same information afterwards and we can still talk. Yeah, I can yeah. give you that. Yep, I'll ahead. do that. I remember that you know it came out openly about how they were going to do it. Yeah, there's a laundry list of things that oh, we have sure. to check the list in the box. So that's why I, I, I hadn't heard it specifically in the rezoning portion of it. But if it's part of the Mountain Village requirement, then I, yeah, we will have to meet that, that requirement. <laughs> I'm good with that. You're safe. Thank you for your yeah. time. <laughs> okay, any other comments? Any other comments from anyone? Thanks for hanging in. Yeah, I appreciate you. Okay, here are no more comments. I'll close this public hearing at 8 uh, 14. Next item will be a master plan review. Thank you. Mayor, if you would, uh, I believe you need to have a, a motion to address this rezoning and. Um, and there should be also a reference in, there should be some discussion and I believe Adrian's already addressed it, it to the extent regarding consistency with the comprehensive plan. And um, I believe you have a, an example motion for the whole, the, a later thing, but it would be along those lines where you would have a discussion at this point and then a motion would be for example, and I'm certainly not trying to put words in anyone's mouth, but um, a motion along the lines of motion to uh, adopt the rezoning uh, proposed and that we find the rezoning to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, and uh, I would ask if it also includes something to the effect of and authorize the mayor to sign a consistency statement to that effect. So if you need a, a motion, uh, some discussion, motion, discussion, votes and second discussion, and, and something has to pass there for that to uh, move forward. But you do need to address consistency with the comprehensive plan, even on this small rezoning map. Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to speak to that. I think it is obviously consistent with the comprehensive plan, and I'll be happy to make a motion after discussion to that point. Okay, I need to. I need to ask one thing. Which one of these are we looking at now? Which it's is the rezoning? The rezoning. Um, it's the public hearing rezoning for a property located at the Walnut Springs Drive. There's the lot four in. Okay, you're looking. Going to show you. you. Without this rezoning this being approved, the master plan right couldn't be reviewed. That's right. So this one is dependent on this one. So yeah. you want to do this one first. Okay. Okay, so we need a motion on rezoning a property located on Walnut Springs Drive and the reference is nine 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 nine. Anyway, further identified as lots 4A, 4B, 4C, 6A, 6B, and 6C. Uh, and with that, do we have a motion to rezone? I move that we approve the rezoning uh, because it's reasonable in the public interest because it does meet the comprehensive plan, specifically land use goal one, objective one, and objective three that say pursuing compatible infill development in order to actively promote appropriate development and redevelopment and to increase density around transportation corridors in accordance with pedestrian and transit oriented development standards. Okay, you heard the motion. Do we have a second? Yes, sir. If I could ask that that motion be addressed the consistency statement in some manner that it would, that you, the motion would include something to the effect that find it consistent and authorize the mayor to sign a consistency statement. Okay, I will add to my motion in addition 
it is, it appears to be, cons it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and we authorize the mayor to sign a consistency statement to that effect. Second. Okay, now we have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Now then. Can I interrupt? Is everyone following the, the agenda except for me? Was I the only one who talked? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. You're good. I'm good. I'm good. You're good. And you're good. good. Yeah. Now, we're, we're, we're to number six now. Okay. 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 I'd like to take the blame for the agenda. I ask it be reorganized right at the last minute. Yeah. So it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the same property. Um, the original master plan that was approved, the current developer wants to deviate from that plan. They're not adding units, um, but they are changing the layout. He's a, he kind of explained it a while ago. I don't have a whole lot more to add to that other than I did provide the uh, Mountain Village uh, regulations in the staff report in your agenda packet that you might want to um, address in the conversation with the developer on the changes to the master plan. Okay, any questions for uh, Adrian? Have you made some progress with them, or is it just coincidence? Yeah, absolutely. And that's the first neighbor we've heard from across the way. Um, but yeah, we once again, I, I'll reiterate. I think they would say the same thing. Um, there was some confusion on who we were when we were talking to them early on. Uh, I, I thank the blame for it. We should have done a better job. Once we got through the planning board meeting, uh, I think we got on the same footing. And from there, we've had very consistent meetings. Anytime one of our staff engineers is in town, uh, he has a meeting with the uh, with um, with Rebecca and Tom, who are the HOA president and vice president. And uh, one of the things we're actually discussing today, which shows you how far we've come, is how to potentially incorporate them into our HOA. There were two issues that they were uh, very concerned about, and we addressed both. All matter of fact, we addressed them at the planning board meeting. Um, one was they have a water line that they're concerned about the pressure. We are not going to tap into their water line uh, other than for these uh, 10 units you just approved, which they already knew. We had the right to go all the way down with their water line, but instead we're bringing off another meter so that we can individually meter our units. They have a master. Um, uh, secondly, the other big issue they have is just the road. And after tonight's conversation, you guys understand the road. Our job before we will be able to turn over to the town of Woodfin will bring all the roads up to your standards before you would accept them or even look at accepting them. We would tell them that we would bring all the roads back up. Now, obviously, we are going to have some truck traffic on some of the roads. We try to do some small things for the neighbors. Um, may or may not be important. One of them was rerouting that out of the way so there wouldn't be headlights coming into one of their backyards. Um, so we try to be thoughtful in some of the requests they've asked, as well as some pre planning, some other things. But yeah, I think if you ask them tonight, um, they're in a much different place than they were uh, three months ago. Uh, and I think it's just been a much better communication. At the public hearing planning and zoning, it was obvious that the neighbors did not, the existing neighbors didn't understand what you were going to do. There were multiple rumors going around, and I saw even in the course of that meeting a lot of heads nodding and people understanding. So that's my take on it. Yeah, it, it, it's a prime example of expecting the worst and <laughs> us not doing a good job of explaining what we wanted to do. And I think once they got to see that we weren't starting the strikes out of Atlanta, we weren't based out of Australia, we were a couple of local groups, and here's the reason 
why. I, I think I kind of started to see it a little bit more. And so, yeah, yeah. once again, live and learn. We, we just didn't have very long. Any further questions or comments? Okay, are we ready for the public hearing now? Public hearing required for this decision for this one to approve the master plan. Bill number six is no public hearing. Those are still good going. That's the number seven. Okay, so we're just going to put a vote on the master plan. Mm -hmm. Review. Oh, master plan. Revision. Okay, you've heard the information on the master plan revision. What's the pleasure of the board? I move that we accept it. It's consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets multiple goals of the town of Woodfin, providing a variety of houses at, at price points, taking advantage of transportation corridors, and making good use of infill property. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now we have a public hearing on amendments to zoning and subdivision ordinances, including 160D. Go build, some, go build some homes for people, okay? Merry Christmas. Thank you. I look forward to 2022 with you. Um, first, I just wanted to go over the timeline of this ordinance review i know you've seen this before but i just want to go over it again um so in october we had a work session with the board of commissioners um, on this document october 11th we took it to the planning and zoning board of adjustment and during that review they asked for more time to review so that was that decision was tabled we scheduled a work session with the planning and zoning board of adjustment on october 18th um, we then met with them on the 8th with the same document and they voted to recommend approval with no amendment. Um, we were slated to hear this last month, public hearing for the Board of Commissioners last month, but it was postponed. Um, so here we are tonight with this public hearing. So I was just going to go over, you all received this document at our orientation meeting on December 1st. And so I was just going to go over the key changes to the ordinance and then open it up for the public hearing and questions. Um, so we added and changed definitions um, relevant to the permitted uses table mainly that weren't def previously defined. We added some definitions that were required by state statute. Uh, we added a permit choice provision, defined site plan requirements, added a completeness review procedures, defined site specific vesting plans, added performance guarantee language for zoning approvals. Um, that clear authority was given in 160D that was um, previously clear for subdivisions, now clear for zoning approvals as well. And we added conflict of interest standards for um, staff members and boards to be consistent with state statute. I'm recommending that we create two boards. We have a planning and zoning board of adjustment. I'd like to divide those into two boards, a planning board and a board of adjustment. Uh, the planning board would have five members. The board of adjustment would have five members and two alternates. Um, we added a reference to the website for zoning map inspection. Um, previously, it was um, something about the newspaper, a little outdated, so we added that technology. We removed uh, the mountainous residential district. It was obsolete and not relevant. Um, we introduced several things, conditional districts, mountain village requirement for conditional districts, other districts optional. This is just an introduction of conditional zoning. I plan to revisit the whole zoning ordinance um, once we get these amendments adopted. Um, we've introduced development agreements that we may not necessarily use. Those are for large scale developments, but if we don't have it in an ordinance, we can't use it. So I took this opportunity to introduce, introduce those. We also introduced administrative minor modifications for approvals of special use permits and conditional zoning approvals. Um, that was something that was authority given in 160D. So that's the zoning ordinance. 
Um, and then the subdivision ordinance, we just made some minor changes. We added major and minor subdivision definitions that were not previously included in the ordinance. Um, we amended the approval for minor subdivisions to be a staff decision. Um, that's four lots or less. And as long as the applicant meets the standards of the ordinance, that um, plat has to be approved. So we thought that um, that could open up some time for board approval and that could be handled administratively. Uh, we did amend procedural requirements to allow for some other options for applicants who might not be quite ready to go through the preliminary plat process. And we amended the performance guarantee language to be consistent with what's required by state statute. And that is in a nutshell what the changes are being recommended for the zoning and subdivision ordinances. Question or comments for Adrian? I have a question. Adrian, could you back up to the second item on your list? <coughs> oh, no. What about the next page? The second item on that. Yeah, add website reference for zoning map inspection. So <clears throat> the ordinance said something along the lines of the zoning map is available for inspection at town hall and can be reviewed in the clerk's office. Uh huh. I'm paraphrasing obviously. Yeah. But we added to that provision that you can also view the zoning map on our website. That's all. Oh, that's all. Yeah. All right. Well, it speak while we're on the topic of zoning maps, um, I've looked at a lot of zoning maps, um, and uh, there's a consistent problem to me as a layperson. The plots are clearly delineated and labeled with this zoning designation or that, but there's not a, a comprehensive, um, what do you call it on a map, a legend. Uh, that describes those zoning designations as you're in like real time as you're looking at the map. Are you using Buckham County GIS? Yes. I can show you how to find the legend. It's kind of hidden in there, but it's there. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm glad it's there. It is. Yeah. It, it is hidden. I think it needs to be more accessible to people. I mean, we're all talking about zoning in, in this town. Right. And it, it should be more accessible, whatever we can do. And you know better than I do what we can do for that. That's it. Yeah, question as well. <clears throat> um, you mentioned the conditional districts. Um, is the intent to bring back some sort of mechanism that would force large developments into conditional districts in the near future? Yeah, this was just the introduction and the opportunity to introduce it. And the Mountain Village District was, it was unclear how those, how those projects needed to be approved or what the procedure was. And so that was, I was just taking the opportunity to get it in there and have that requirement. Got it. As a, as a jumping off point, I understand that's going to be a later discussion, but I would, I would just throw it out there that what, what we might want to look at is something along the lines of requiring any development that say for residential is 20 or more units to immediately go into conditional zoning or for commercial is more than 30, 40, 50, whatever you think appropriate for square footage. But I think that type of trigger would be a, a, a useful one to build in. Yeah, I do like that idea. And I, we'll definitely be reviewing that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, one comment, it's been a long road. You've been very patient uh, with us newbies in particular. So I think you've done a really good job of hanging in there and revising and making your revisions clear. And I appreciate that from you. Thank I'm you. definitely Me open too. to your feedback, so I want to get that. You know, I want your thoughts too, so that's good. You've, got, you've gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten it. Any other comments? Okay, we'll move into the public hearing part of this. This time at uh, 8.30, I'll open this public hearing on amendments to zoning and subdivision ordinances in 160 days. Anyone wish to speak? Have anyone wishing to speak?
guides and zoning such as uh, sidewalk development, dark sky, hidden, uh, buried utilities, those type of things. Uh, uh, or even uh, development of uh, uh, common architectural language and things of that nature. And how does that, how, do, how do we, how does that, is it at this level or is it buried deeper in the development of the uh, uh, guidelines? We do have some of that now, but it is in a, at a deeper level. We'll be getting to those things at, later on once we get past this part. So this is more of a procedural, procedural changes. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, I'll close this public hearing at uh, 8.33 p.m. Okay, now we're ready to vote on uh, this is um, this would be the opportunity if somebody wanted to make a motion to make uh, um, um, a change or an amendment to the ordinances as presented, they could do that. And if any of those motions for changes were made and approved, then there would be the kind of the, the wind up that would incorporate those. So if there were any specific amendments or modifications to that anybody wanted to make a motion to, that's, I would ask that you consider those first and then move to the kind of the wrap up uh, motion, which I've kind of given you an example of. Uh, up there, or as uh, Adrian did. So that just kind of puts it, makes it clearer in terms of any changes, uh, as how they are addressed, and then the final one kind of does the same thing we did a while ago, which addresses having a public hearing and, and the comprehensive plan and that sort of thing. So it's kind of two-phase thing, unless, unless, but if there are no motions for amendments, then you move directly to the final wrap up. Okay, Adrian, do you have any more comments? Okay, do we have a motion to the amendment? Can I add any way? Okay, then I'll entertain a motion from the board to approve. So I would I will make a motion to approve the uh, proposed text amendment in that it's consistent with the Town of Woodfin comprehensive plan. Uh, that it is reasonable considering the potential benefits to development of the Town of Woodfin and the surrounding community. And the proposed text amendment advances the public health, safety, and welfare of the Town of Woodfin and further that the mayor is authorized to sign any necessary consistency statements along those lines. Now have a second to that motion. I second it. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> okay. Nice. <laughs> right, next item. <laughs> I don't know which one of these one of these agendas are way on now. <laughs> okay, the next item is appointments to the planning board, board of adjustment, and CPSC. What is that? So one of the three will be the planning board, and Adrian will speak to those. So now that we have the board will be split out based on those amendments to the ordinance and that first meeting, they, they will be split out officially February 1st. 
Um, we're going to have one more meeting of the joint board just for continuity's sake. Um, so the mayor and I spent some time interviewing folks last week that had applied for the planning board and the board of adjustment and we landed on five people for the planning board. Some of them are on the current board and um, actually the planning board, all of them are on the current board except for one. So um, we are recommending that Jay Grimmett be appointed to a three-year term as chairperson. He's on the board now. Jeff Angel be appointed as a regular member to a three-year term. Dylan Deccant, a regular member for two years. Glenda Overbeck, a regular member for two years. And Kimberly Hunter, a regular member for one year. And the reason we have those staggered is because it's going to be three-year staggered terms. So um, since this is a new board, we have to start off that way. Okay, you've heard the recommendation on the planning board. We have a motion to accept them. So moved. Second. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? In favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. to keep going please <laughs> so for the board of adjustment we have um, five members and two alternates these are this is made up of quite a few new people it seems like board of adjustments kind of scary to people I think um, but so Susanna Carver who currently serves on the plan going board of adjustment we are recommending recommending that she be appointed to a three-year term as chairperson Patricia Hoffman a regular member to a three-year term. Um, Stephanie Gosnell, regular member to a two-year term. Scott Hansen, a regular member to a two-year term. Michael Bennett, a regular member to a one-year term. And then the two alternates, Dana Late and Chris Derone, for one year. Okay, you've heard these recommendations. What's the pleasure of the board? Move to accept them. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And finally, the Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee. We took applications for this for about a month, and um, uh, one of the consultants we're working with, Linda Giltz, and I interviewed, um, I think it was about 15 people or so, and uh, over the last two weeks, and we landed on some recommendations. <coughs> We have, we provided a little blurb about each one that we are recommending to be recommended, to be appointed in your packet. Um, so without further ado, so we have two members that will be liaisons to their respective boards. So we're recommending that Hazel Thornton um, be the liaison to the Board of Commissioners and Glenda Overbeck be the liaison to the Planning Board. Um, outside of that, we recommend uh, Gus Mejica, Amanda Ray, Kenneth Kahn, Judy Butler, Scott Austin, and Will Geiser be appointed to the steering committee. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have about any of those individuals. I, it, it, that's an outstanding group. Congratulations. It is. It's going to be a really good group. Does we have a motion regarding uh, the Comprehensive steering Plan Steering Committee? I think we accept it. Have a second? Second. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're at number we're at number I'm just looking for twelve right there. Okay, number twelve police Woodson Police Department Professional Development Plan, uh, Chief. Well, good evening to you all. Um, and welcome to our new uh, commissioners. Um, most of you have heard the uh, presentation that I'm about to give uh, kind of uh, in a smaller form. 
but I'm going to take this evening and take an opportunity to kind of expand a little further on it. Probably one of my guys outside and make sure he didn't need anything from me. Um, so what I'm presenting to you tonight is the career, de career development program. If I can, <coughs> pardon me for a moment. I'm going to breathe. Excuse me. Uh, the career development program for the Woodman Police Department. Uh, now, this is something that we've developed uh, collab collaboratively, uh, not just the police department's input, but also went through the administration and finance uh, to make a, a plan that was workable um, and also practical. Uh, one of the big things that we are looking at and that we were facing everywhere is retention. Um, it's not a, a secret that uh, officers are leaving law enforcement across the country, and especially locally. Uh, we've been affected with that as well, uh, where officers leave either to go to other departments where they have uh, you know, more opportunity for advancement, pay raise, or some leave the, the profession altogether to find higher paying jobs. Um, we're under no illusion when we come into law enforcement that we're here to do this to get rich. However, we wanna make sure that we are competitive with other departments and can uh, keep the talent that we've recruited. Um, and when we look at this, recruitment and retention, retention is the big thing. We spend a lot of uh, capital when we bring someone into the police department. Uh, not only monetarily, you know, it's, uh, see from this, it's about $10,000 to equip an officer. Um, just that's to get them from in the door to out on the street. Uh, that includes uniforms, firearms, tasers, cameras, radios, computers, all these things add up. A lot of them can't be recycled. Uh, when we buy a uniform for somebody, it's theirs. When we buy a ballistic vest for someone, it's theirs. It's custom fit to that person. Um, so that's a lot of things that come right off the bat that we're investing in. Um, but then we spend a lot of time training these officers. Uh, they spend 420 hours in field training with us. Uh, not to mention the almost 700 hours of, field, of basic law enforcement training that they've had. Um, and then we send them to additional training that we require from our department. Uh, and so that's a lot of investment that we put into them right off the bat. Uh, so the time from loss of officer to new hire being patrol ready, I said if we do lose somebody, not only are we losing that experience, but we're losing time. Uh, if uh, we lose someone today and we have to hire a new officer, Best case scenario, right? I have an application sitting on my desk ready to go and I start the process. It's still four months until that officer is now feel, uh, patrol ready, right? That 420 hours of field training, that's the, that's the tail end of it. Then we also have the get them in the door process, which is doing a background investigation, which means calling former employers, uh, you know, criminal background check, all those things, checking them now through our uh, decertification registry. Uh, we want to make sure that we do all those things. Uh, and then once we are, we've completed that and we do interviews and we have a series of interviews that occur. Then we have to wait on the state of North Carolina and those who have dealt with the state of North Carolina, there's, they're not always the quickest in getting things done. Uh, a typical turnaround from the time that we submit their paperwork to the time that they send it back that we can actually uh, get them to the mayor to have them sworn in is Best case scenario, again, about two weeks. Usually takes a little longer, but two weeks is a, a, a good starting point there. Um, can you, yes, can, sir. Can you clarify, so your new hires have to be approved by someone in the state government? That's correct. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so that's the certification. That's where our authority is derived, is through uh, criminal justice standards. Okay. Okay. And so they verify that an officer meets the requirements, that they've not been decertified, that they have not had other issues with other departments that we didn't find. Uh, so they take that information, they run them through their database uh, and check to make sure that's good. A lot of it's administrative though. Okay, yeah, we've sent this information in. They process it through someone's there doing the paperwork, but you know, CJ Standards is a small office and they are uh, doing paperwork for 400 agencies across North Carolina. So it takes them time to get that done. Um, and so, the, you know, the folks that work there do a great job. They're very helpful, but they have a lot of volume, so it's not very quick in their return. Um, 
So, you know, it's a, it, it's a loss of time from the time that we lose somebody to the time we can actually replace that spot. Uh, and then again, that's providing we can find somebody. Uh, right now, the applicant pool is low. Uh, there aren't a lot of folks who want to be police officers right now, uh, which is disappointing for us, and it's something that we deal with. Uh, when we get in applications, our, uh, like our last uh, round of hiring, uh, where we had opened it up, we had uh, just a handful of applications, and they, out of those, only three met our requirements, which is they have already had to gone through basic law enforcement training, have to be a resident of North Carolina, have a North Carolina driver's license. I mean, that's kind of the minimums. We only had three, and, you know, and out of those three, you know, we, we were scrutinizing each of them, doing their background investigations, uh, and trying to find the best applicant. And uh, fortunately, we were able to uh, bring aboard one of our reserve officers to fill a spot, uh, decided he'd want to come back to the agency. But that was, truthfully for us, that was luck. Uh, you know, finding a good quality candidate, though, is hard to do right now. So instead of recruiting, what we should be do is retaining. We should be retaining the officers that we have. And the way to do that is to reward them for being here. And it's not necessarily about money, but that is a part of it, and I'm not going to lie, that officers want to be paid better. <coughs> you know, again, we're not in this to, to get rich, but at the same time, we need to be able to provide for our families. We need to, you know, be rewarded for what we do. Uh, so instead of necessarily paying them better, or in addition to paying them a little better, we also want to recognize them for their accomplishments, okay? And that's what our career development program does. It sets a series of goals for them to reach. And then when they do that, each of those goals is, involves training, time, okay, making sure that they're uh, you know, not having any discipline issues, things like that. Each of those gets them to that next step. Uh, and f the benefit for us is it's increased professionalism within the agency. We have professional trained officers who are wanting to do more to be better. Uh, increased skills, knowledge, and abilities for the officers provides a defined growth, uh, path for growth and advancement of an officer. We're, again, we're a small department. We only have X amount of sergeant positions, um, which means not everybody can be a sergeant. Right? Not everybody can promote up necessarily, but they can still advance using our career development program. And then the town receives the benefit of having those well-trained officers with increased experience. Uh, now this next section is uh, where uh, actually Sherry Powers, uh, uh, finance officer, uh, before she came to us, worked with the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office and helped them implement a career development program. And so a lot of the things that we uh, looked at, we based off of their program. And another part of that is we looked at what their levels were. Once their career development career development program came into fruition, what levels were they paying their officers as opposed to what are our proposed rates with our officers? And here's a kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of those numbers. Obviously, we're not paying the level of the sheriff's office, but this gets us a little more competitive than, uh, than where we were. And then examples of compensation under the proposed plan, a, a patrol officer with one, two years experience, currently making $43,896, that's the average. Uh, proposed would take them up to 46086 a year. Again, that's lower than what the county's paying. Um, a sergeant average salary right now is $51,629. This would advance them up to 55891 again, below what the county is, all right? Now, we have some estimates for the cost of this. Uh, it says the maximum budget impact for fiscal year uh, with all benefits, okay, and that's their salary, uh, retirement, all those things included, uh, for the remainder of the fiscal year would be 26,453. Um, and that's making an assumption. That is that all the officers, based on their years of experience, have the other qualifications to advance to that next level. They've uh, taken the required classes, uh, that they have to take, they you know not had a discipline issue, which fortunately, not many of our officers have had a discipline issue. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that they've also taken standardized field sobriety testing yet. And without that class, they can't advance to that next level. Okay, so again, that's the uh, the estimated cost, uh, actual cost of January one implementation will likely be less, estimated around fourteen thousand. 
And so here's the hidden risk of not adopting the career plan, increased training costs, uh, increased overtime costs, uh, uniform equipment, less experienced officers, and then the folks that we do train and we, we get out there, someone else is going to take them. And then you all have a copy of that, that plan, which gives you, again, all the steps of what they need to do and then the required years of experience for each of those uh, uh, advancement goals. Any questions? Look, I have a question. I heard you say that the uh, town has a uh, restriction for North Carolina residents on them. Well, you, well, you have to be a North Carolina resident to, uh, I'm sorry, you have to have a North Carolina driver's license, not necessarily right. be a resident. You have to have a North Carolina driver's license to be a police officer in the state of North Carolina. That's one of our requirements. Well, why is that? Well, I mean, what, what I'm asking, so I live in Kentucky, and I want to move down here. So you can transfer in. That, that's, a, that's a different thing. Um, okay. I mean, yeah, so but one of those requirements is you have to come down here and get your North Carolina driver's license sure, sure. before we're going to bring you on board. Okay, okay, okay. That, the way I took it, you had to be a North Carolina resident to even apply for the no, job. No, no, that's one of the requirements. Before we can swear you in, you have to have a North yeah, Carolina driver's okay, license. Okay, okay. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all. Okay, you heard the, the presentation there. Do we watch the pleasure of the board? Okay. 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 the best case projection for this being implemented if everything goes as planned? It is implemented if you vote for it. Yeah, it is implemented. But the, okay, the, so it would kick into effect immediately. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The, okay. the police department is requesting that this become effective January the 1st. Okay, thank you. The, we took the, uh, the chief made a projection based on years of service. Um, day one, even if someone has been here five years, for example, and they would qualify for a police officer two or three, they may not have the training that, that's required for that step in the pay plan, or it, it'll likely take folks six months or a year to get up to speed. So only a few folks day one would actually increase in pay. They'll have to take the initiative to provide the training documentation and the other things that are required under the plan. So day one, you may have a few folks that qualify. Our estimate is that it'll be about half of that fully loaded cost, which includes your payroll taxes and pensions and, and other benefits that are related to pay, mm -hmm. um, uh, around 14000 We can likely absorb that in his overall budget, but it will, we won't really know that for sure until closer to the end of the mm -hmm. year. And if you approve this, just be aware we may have to come back with an amendment at a later date. Mm -hmm. And then tell us about next year's budget. Yeah, next year's budget <coughs> will increase based on the, the folks that, that qualify to participate at higher levels in this plan. And, and I can't give this a higher endorsement. I've just got to say we, we worked on a similar plan at the sheriff's office. It is best practice in the industry. Like the chief said, these are not the highest paid folks, but they do really good work for all of us and keeping everybody safe and the things they are required to do in their position is just, it, it's, it's beyond amazing to me. So it's a, it's a really good thing to get folks in here, provide them a career path. So for, for a patrol officer, for example, the pay range, instead of having everybody paid the same and the only difference is a little bit of longevity we pay each year, they have the ability to grow their salary in, a, in about a $10,000 range under this plan if they stay here for a while 
And, you know, I, I want the 10-year guy coming to my house if something's wrong and not somebody that's only been here six weeks because they've had, they've seen it all. They've had a lot of experience. They're going to be more effective in, in keeping all of us safe. So I think that um, it, it's good business. You're going to keep people here, and you'll end up saving money in all these areas of overtime and training and, and things that are sort of um, behind-the-scenes costs. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> Paul? I'm sensitive to the um, budgetary implications of what I'm about to say, but for all the reasons that Chief Dice mentioned, uh, can, can the town afford to knowingly pay less than what other departments in the immediate area are paying? Or, you know, if, if, if the county's numbers are real, if that's what they're actually Chair, uh, Chief, you want to address how you arrived at those numbers, or where you landed, and right. how so what the methodology we, was? We, we took these numbers, and Sherry did, again, a lot of this work, and I'm very grateful for her help. But we took our current uh, pay plan for the, for the town of Wilson, uh, and then using those numbers as a base, uh, we took each level at a set percentage increase. Okay. So we're, we're operating on, again, kind of what our base numbers were. Well, I'm with you. I don't think we can pay them enough for the job that they do. I really don't. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have to balance being frugal with the taxpayers' dollars. I realize that the recommended re recommended salary is an increase from where we are today, but it's still slightly below that of the sheriff's office. Um, I can tell you that just from my experience, the dynamics of the sheriff's office as an agency is, is very different. They're 400 members strong. Um, they have a lot of flexibility in scheduling and things when they have folks out on FMLA or vacation. They'll just slide somebody else in the spot. At a very small town like Woodfin, when you only have three men on a squad, if somebody's out sick or um, we have several folks that are expecting this year that'll be out on FMLA for a while, then somebody <coughs> else has to move in and take that spot that we have to pay overtime to. So there's an opportunity to earn overtime here in Woodfin that the County folks don't have, Sheriff's Office doesn't pay anybody overtime. Um, uh, when, when you were doing the pay and classification study, you looked at all the many municipalities against which you benchmarked. We did. We, we and you set those, those structures and pay schedules more equivalent to municipalities. This is one example, but we use this one because point. this is what it was modeled after. It's not necessarily what we're trying to do. In our review of salaries and, and <coughs> where we Eric makes a very valid point. Um, we not we don't we use the county as a comparison here because their um, career development plan is the most similar to what Whitman is trying to implement. Um, we, however, looked at the salaries for Black Mountain, Weaverville, um, Fletcher. Um, the League of Municipalities puts out a survey by population, and we looked at all the towns that have a population of five to ten thousand similar to us, and created an average for those plans, and we compared our averages to Buffalo County, which is our biggest competitor, Asheville Police Department, also a big competitor. Um, and from that, you did make some adjustments immediately. We did, yes. From that. 
So we, we took all those factors into consideration <coughs> in arriving at, at the recommended numbers. Uh, well, the chair's office numbers are accurate as of yesterday because I called the session. Walter, and one other, one other factor in there too, when, when you're looking at, at the salary and you look at benefits, Buncom County has got an excellent benefit package that quite frankly, smaller <coughs> municipalities can't afford. It's hard, it's a better package than the city of Iceville's got, for example. They've got a lot of stuff built into it. And a lot of times, people, if they're, you know, you know Iceville Police Department's had a lot of people leave there in the last, well, two years, I guess. And a lot of them have gone to other smaller departments or they've gone to the Sheriff's Department even though the Sheriff's Department's having a lot of problems now, just like all law enforcement agencies, but when you factor all of that in, that's the reason that smaller departments have to uh, have something like this pay plan, career development plan, just to keep up. No, I'm all in favor of keep Iceland. We appreciate it, and I absolutely agree with you, and I hope that in the next year, particularly as we go into budget cycle, that. We, we can find a way to get this up because I get asked by people all the time, how, how do you guys hire and keep a cop when Sonic and McDonald's are paying more? I, I don't get it, and I've had to tell them I don't get it either. So I really hope that we'll all be committed to finding ways to improve this, and uh, hopefully being a policeman in Wood, a police person in Woodfin will be the place in Western North Carolina everybody would want to compete to. And I know that sounds a little grandiose, but I think we can try I agree. Okay, do we have a ask again? Do we have a motion? I make a motion that we um, accept this compensation proposed plan have a high regard and a high respect for law enforcement. My father was chief deputy of Buncombe County for many, 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 many years. And I truly respect everything they do. So um, I, I'm with everybody else. They need more. You cannot pay them enough. Mm -hmm. So I make the motion we accept this. Do we have a second? No. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Will, will that need a budget? Well, yes, yes, will, yes. Will that need a budget amendment? Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, so Sherry said that if she's going to monitor what no, okay. projects for no, no, no. she may bring a budget okay. amendment back for okay. that. Um, and can we take a five minute break? Sure. Okay, okay. we're going to take a five minute break. Let <coughs> you know, get a little bit of relief over here. <laughs> <laughs> I can see a walk. This is for the consistency statement for the rezoning of the springs.
It's a it's a fifth wheel. Oh yeah. yeah. So it's about a hundred foot long. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not exactly on top of ourselves, but we don't exactly bite friends over and have dinner either. So we bring it on the count of two, and when my kids show up, one of us is being usually the old man. So yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's one back here behind where you all are sitting. That's the one that I see. There may be one up here, but I don't, I don't see. <laughs> I didn't have an adapter for the three <laughs> Where are we? Where are we? We're not for the first time. Thank you. 
Just for for the record, uh, the chief is our IT department too. <laughs> that is not exaggeration. The final item on the regular agenda is um, representation on committees. So um, as you know, um, and as town staff has been working on, there it is, um, we have, this is the list, of the comprehensive list, to the best of our knowledge, um, of committees and uh, subcommittees that some of the board members serve on, some elected officials currently or have been in the past serving on these boards. And uh, in, your, uh, in your packet, we also have some staff um, assignments. So I left those off of this for this purpose tonight, just to say that these are the ones that we're uh, aware of um, and that we would like you all to consider the two vacancies. So these seats are now vacant and so the Asheville Area Rede Riverfront Redevelopment Commission, I provide a link um, in your uh, in your packet also, uh, describing what that what the purpose of that is. It, it operates under the auspices of the City of Asheville, um, and uh, it is for uh, economic development and, and planning purposes and their coordination among those communities and those entities who have interest uh, along the French Broad River, and so. Uh, uh, former uh, commissioner of Ethan Tanner was serving on this. It's a monthly meeting. And so the, I, will, I should have prefaced by saying you all do not have to make a decision on these tonight, but you're encouraged to if you're ready to. Um, this board does meet uh, monthly. This commission meets monthly. And so I've talked with uh, the city of Asheville, and so they are requesting that you all send someone uh, back to that commission. It is not required that, that it be an elected official to uh, be a Roodkin representative. Um, and on that board, there's four or five from the city of Asheville and a few from Buncombe County and, and some other agencies. River Link is one of those participating agencies as well. Uh, so that is uh, a decision point for you all. The other is the Whitman Greenway and Blueway subcommittee of this board. So this is not a formal subcommittee actually, or hasn't been, but it has operated as a unit in the past. And so Commissioner Giesen Tanner also was a member there. And so when we have issues that really need to be addressed, when there are con construction meetings or uh, various um, staff meetings, so we meet monthly with River Lake, Buncombe County, Town of Woodfin. Um, and so Commissioner Lunsford uh, will attend that um, uh, many months. And so we report back out to, to what's going on. We do the monthly reports to you all. But this is really just a way to have more immediate attention on certain matters that do need attention. An example of that was we had some redesign uh, for the pirate ship in Silverline Park, and there was some some chain, a change order that was going to be somewhat significant in, in cost. And so Commissioner Lunsford and the mayor were in uh, consultation with uh, with myself and would have been Luke at the time, but our, our engineering group also just to walk through that and to understand what that is. And we're not necessarily acting on behalf of the board in full, but it is another uh, group to which the town staff would refer. So those are the two vacancies that it will be important at some point for you all to um, make appointments to. So that's all I have to say. This is rather informal. You can make it as formal. You can do appointments if you choose to tonight. You can wait till January. 
Um, there's nothing that's going to be lost in the meantime, as I understand it. Eric, Sir. the first item, did you say there was more information in the packet as to what the AARRC is and does? Yes, there was a, there was a, a summary document. <coughs> Let's see, I'll pull it up. Let me. I don't, I could, I didn't find that. There's a staff report memo. Happy to share that with you. Yep. You don't have to do it right now, but uh, I'm, I'm there. Thank you how we got involved on that. <clears throat> on that, Jim, back when, when the city first established, this was before the River Arts District, and they were looking at doing that. Uh, they were talking about the greenways and some other things that might impact the town of Woodson. And we were finding out after the fact instead of up front. So I requested from the city that we be, that we have a seat on the AARRC. Okay. And we got one and I served on there for a while and then uh, Debbie Gusen Tanner served on there for a while. But I think it's good that we have somebody to serve on there just to make sure we know what's going on with the River Arts District and how venture. What kind of time of commitment, Jerry, did you encounter with that? About two hours a month. Yep. And so um, what, uh, what the city staff person says, Stephanie Munson Dahl, said that there are monthly meetings, there are occasional special meetings if something has come up that the the commission should weigh on more frequently the monthly and an annual retreat, um, and that's the that's the commitment. And it is up to two three-year terms. So it's an initial three-year appointment, um, and I, I suspect that this will be served out the remainder of Commissioner Giesen Tanner's, and then reappointment, if desired. So again, it doesn't have to be one of you all, but it, it can be. There's no. I always felt like it was worth it to us just to have somebody on the board. I will do that one if, unless somebody else wants to. It, we need to fill these and uh, and, and I've given a report on the Greenway Blueway project. They invited me to or to town to describe what's going on with the project and so they want to stay very actively involved. <coughs> Is this the kind of thing where we report back to the board of commissioners periodically? Ideally, that's what you would do. Okay. And I'd I'll be step up and do that one unless somebody else wants to. No, that that sounds good, and I'd be happy to do the Greenway and Blueway subcommittee. I've uh, handled. Uh, right of way acquisition for the city of Asheville and its rad dip project. So I think that that's going to be coming up, especially in relation to the greenway. So happy to, happy to join that, that subcommittee. Thank you. Yeah, it's both of you. I don't know where it's at now. Do I need to come? It's been virtual. I was on that committee for where I was appointed by the city of Ashland, and I was on it for five, six years. Do I need to reach out to them and tell them I'm going to just uh, call Stephanie? Yeah. Right. I think if you want to make a decision tonight, I'll just I'll respond to her and say you can now add and then contact information, and I would CC whoever. That's 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 Basically, it's an advisory committee to the city. We need a motion to do this, Eric. Mayor, we need a motion and vote. No, we didn't. No. We didn't do it before. I just appointed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Point away, sir. Yeah. Belt suspenders approach is probably fine too. Or it just to just codify it for the record. But that's just all. Um, cool. Yeah, I don't know. We didn't have. We hadn't had one before. We just. No, but it might be better just to go ahead and have a motion and vote. Does somebody want to make a motion to? Uh, Jim will handle this. I'll move that Jim will serve on the um, what is it? First? The Ashland area. A A R D C. Yes. Have a second. Second. Any discussion on 
favor with me. I, yeah. I, any opposed? Circulation. <laughs> now they need about five hours. Every week. Can I move that uh, Eric Edgerton join the Wooden and Greenway and Blue Way subcommittee? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So now it's the reports since they're just to, to end the suspense. Note the part that you serve in our pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Keep us happy. <laughs> Well, you have the slide deck, actually, copy of that. Yes, sir. We can go from the other one. Starting on page 36, the slide deck. I mean, I could fake it, but uh, not so much. All right, well, good evening again. Uh, I've already been in front of you once, so I will try to keep this uh, kind of brief this evening. Uh, for the new commissioners, what I usually do is you have a copy of our totals. Uh, kind of gives you a, a little snapshot of what we've done within the past month. Um, but these are just numbers. And numbers really don't tell a story. Uh, numbers just, they're, they're, they're kind of there. Uh, and so what we're going to do is I'll, I'll highlight some of those numbers and, and give you what they what they mean, but then also give you some other points of interest for the police department within the past month. Uh, as we look down at our total dispatch events, 405 as opposed to 550 uh, this time last year, our, our total uh, calls for service has been down, and a lot of that's been due to staffing. Uh, we have folks out, so that means we're less proactive, out doing less things. And so we'll see that trend for the entire year. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the same token, uh, we've had some of our uh, things such as motor vehicle crashes. Uh, if you'll look about uh, two thirds of the way down the uh, left hand side column, uh, we had uh, 28 this month as opposed to 11 last year for November. However, our total trend is actually down and we like that. Um, you know, we like having less motor vehicle crashes. Uh, also see that our citations issued, again, that's down because we have less proactive activity, because we have officers that are out. Yes, sir. The overall trend is down, yet the year over year is dramatic. Maybe I misunderstood. Crashes and vehicles involved. Correct. So uh, last year, 2020, it's actually an anomaly month. To have 11 crashes in a month is a very low number. Mm -hmm. uh, usually we average around 20 to 30 crashes in a month. Uh, 28 for November of this year is about on average. Uh, when we look at uh, the past few years where we've been at you know, 270, uh, you know, well, 300 and then kind of dropping down, the trend has been down this year as opposed to last year. And when we get our final numbers together at the end of the year, we'll flesh that out and see where we really are. 
but anecdotally looking at each month, we noticed that those numbers have been down. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll put those into a true uh, uh, comprehensive report of what, what those numbers look like. But in any time of the year, 11 crashes in a month is very low. We like months like that. Unfortunately, we didn't have one of those in November of this year. Uh, persons arrested 11, took 33 incident reports. Uh, when you see what the crimes that we took those, the ones that we highlight, the breaking and enterings, larcenies, um, you know, zero breaking and enterings for a month is a, is a great thing, but we had four larcenies, uh, six damage to properties. Uh, there was no, again, no crime hotspots, no single trend. Uh, some of the crimes that we've been seeing uh, throughout the area, uh, we've had reports of uh, catalytic converter thefts is one that I've mentioned kind of frequently. Uh, you know, again, we had some of those last month, um, but, you know, not as many as we've had previously throughout the year. So those are still occurring. Uh, then our investigations, uh, they took on seven new cases. Uh, made one felony charge and they closed out five of those cases. Uh, and just kind of a quick summary from what they had uh, involved a uh, uh, sexual assault investigation um, with a juvenile offender that they're working, uh, some felony financial fraud, stolen utility trailer was uh, recovered here in, in uh, town. Um, had a, uh, someone who was staying on the uh, old uh, Craggy Motors property. Uh, they were kind of set up in their camping. We've taken care of that issue. Uh, unattended death. We had a couple of natural death investigations that we worked throughout the month. the highlights of, the, of those. Uh, one of the other things I like to do is point out some of the more uh, recent or pressing things that we've done. Uh, and one is like a good news article, such as today. Uh, three of our officers uh, participated in the Shop with the Cop program. Uh, so they were up at the Walmart in Weaverville uh, for several hours today, uh, shopping with underprivileged children, helping them pick out uh, gifts. Uh, so uh, I'm very thankful for the officers that went uh, gave up their day off to go do something like that. So we're, you know, proud of those folks for doing that today. Um, as uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we have our grant approval. We're in that process of now doing, crossing all the T's, dotting the I's, and curling the Q's, and it's a very involved process. Uh, but we hope to uh, uh, get that grant implemented in its fullest and get the uh, equipment which we've uh, requested, which is replacing radios for our vehicles, uh, get that process started. <coughs> and then we are uh, also still working on the, uh, the grant for this fiscal year. Uh, the federal grant cycle begins in October. Um, so it would actually be next October before they award that grant. Uh, so we're working on a grant application for this year. That closes on January 31st. I'm still working with my staff to address what our needs are and what the, those funds would best be used for. We have a few ideas of what it could be, but we want to narrow it down to one object before we uh, go with that grant uh, proposal. Um, as you may be aware, we did have a fatality crash on 26 uh, on the 5th of this month, uh, where a uh, construction worker in the, uh, in the construction zone was hit on 26 future 26 westbound uh, between uh, mile marker 25 and 24. Uh, that investigation, uh, we're actually, I've just closed out uh, when we had charged the uh, driver of that vehicle with a uh, felony move over violation. Uh, it does not meet the elements for a felony death by vehicle because there was no impairment or uh, other aggravating factor that was raised until that and also a misdemeanor death by motor vehicle. Uh, so we're still working, we're still working parts of that case, but it's mostly wrapped up at this point. Um, trying to think what else. 
think those are the big items that we have right now. Any questions for me? All right. Then thank you all and Merry Christmas. Thank you. I want to give you a few quick updates. Um, the comprehensive plan progress. We have a survey completed that's now on our website. We have been getting some responses from that. We plan to get into the distribution of that, um, the, the paper version after the holidays. Um, and after the holidays begin stakeholder interviews and public meetings um, as part of, our, part of our public engagement. Get really involved with that um, in January. And we plan to have the steering committee meet on January 11th um, to start reviewing guiding principles, the vision statement, um, some of the survey results we've gotten and get that conversation going with them. Um, a lot of this month was spent um, coordinating interviews with applicants and going through applications, so that took up some time. Um, but I did have a development coordination meeting with Buncombe County so we could be a little bit more cohesive in our permitting processes, so that, that was good, and we're gonna keep, keep that conversation going to see how we can better work together. Um, the steep slope draft is, is, there's a draft, but that review is postponed until January. That planning board meeting was canceled due to lack of a quorum. Um, and the stormwater plan is near completion. We'll be bringing that to you definitively in February. Um, the ordinance review is slow and steady, but it's, it's going, um, so I'm not in a huge hurry on that, so I'm kind of taking my time there, focusing on other things. Um, for permits and enforcement, we, um, we're gonna start giving you a actual report with your agenda packet next month. We did, ha we have the new permitting software, iWork, that we're gonna be using up and running, so that's gonna help us with our record keeping and better permits and all that fun stuff. So we'll be able to provide you these in a written form. But um, our new code enforcement officer, Penny Sams, has been very busy um, issuing violations and getting things cleaned up. So she's got nine active violations right now. She's been working hard on illegal sign removal. Um, that's been one of her priorities. And we are in the beginning stages of development of a minimum housing program um, so we can work on those issues. Adrian, is there a way for one of us to see without having to call you or Penny what she's working on and what she's done? Is there some place to look at that? Uh, pretty soon we're gonna have a portal that'll be um, open for public access and you can search what's going on anywhere in town. Um, that's part of the iWork platform. That's part of the iWork platform. So that's our next step in, in getting all that complete and ready to go. So that'll be on our website. Okay. Just a number we call if we see something, if we just call the town hall. You can just call town hall. We also have a planning at woodfriend-nc.gov email that you, it's, that you can email if you see complaints, um, more of a generic email address. Any thoughts of copying more or less what Asheville does where a, any resident can take a picture of something and it goes automatically to the, de the department to look at? Um, they not, necessarily, an app, which not totally against it. Clever. We haven't had that conversation. Um, so we're still, we're, we're getting all that up and running. Okay. So that'll be right. part of the conversation, yeah. So we gotta do a complaint on the, on the portal. Is there a way to upload a file like a photograph to that? I don't know the answers to that yet. We haven't gotten to the portal training, so I'm not sure what the capability is gonna be there. Nash will develop their own in-house for their That's a separate. That's a separate software than the permitting. Complaints, and that's the that's what Jim is referencing, I believe. You log onto the Asheville app or whatever. But that's the yeah. Okay, I think I think what you're what you're saying is it'd be great because it's easy for people to report things to, and I think that's consistent with what the the draft. Instead of taking a picture and attaching it to an email and sending it, if there was. Yeah. Something a little more streamlined seems like it'd be. Yeah, you gotta be forward into it and just upload the photograph. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, once we get this permitting software 
up and running and feel comfortable with that, we can look at other, okay. other options. Um, and then we had 20 zoning permits issued this month and half of those were sing for single family homes. So I thought that was an interesting tidbit to share. And that's all I have unless you have any questions. slides I'll try to go by the, over this kind of quickly um, most of this information you all were given in our workshop uh, training session we had a few weeks ago our um, amended budget for the general fund is six million two hundred thirty thousand dollars we've collected today uh, as of November 30th uh, 1.6 million that's about 26 percent of the budget not all revenue items come in a, in a linear linear fashion we get most of our tax revenue this time of year, December, January, February. Um, to, to give you a point of reference, as, as of this time, the November 30th uh, date last year, we had only collected 1.2 million. So um, our revenue is up from last year and it's consistent with where we should be at this point in time. Um, to show you the trends of our major sources of funds, Property taxes is the blue line, and you'll see year over year how they have steadily increased with growth and uh, increased property values. Uh, similar circumstance with sales tax, as more people move to the town of Woodson, um, more businesses operate, uh, more sales tax is generated. And um, the other lesser but significant revenues are utility billing taxes, power bill, permits, and and fees and it just sort of gives you a reference of how our revenue streams have grown over the years. Um, property tax and assessed value, th this slide uh, I, I shared with you during your training just shows how the property tax and the assessed values have increased and give you some reference as to uh, the amount of revenue we achieve from the taxpayers of the town of Woodson. Sales tax, um, has been a, a, a sort of an outlier, a little bit surprising. It's really outperformed la at least the last two years, everyone's projections. The yellow line represents um, where we are today. We've already taken in another 126,000 in the month of December. So that line is um, gonna be pretty consistent. We're, we're about 10% um, above the projected budget for this year, which we increased over last year's level. So if, if sales tax remains at the current level, I'll start, providing you with pr uh, predictions as to how we're gonna end up uh, in the next few months as we as we go throughout the budget year, we'll be a couple hundred thousand dollars ahead in that revenue line alone, which is a great place to be. Um, so expenditure to date, we are at 2,094,000 at the end of November. We have another 337 encumbered roughly 39% of your budget. Um, if you five at five months out of the year, you should be no more than about 41%. So we're in pretty good shape on the expenditure side as well. Fund balance as of the end of last year was $3,981,514. Uh, restricted fund balance was right at 672,000. That includes the money we unspent Powell bill funds and other dedicated funding sources for unauthorized substance tax. And then the state stabilization, the state requires us to reserve a small part of our budget um, based on a formula that uh, the statute requires for us to, to do. So that's, that's that amount. Uh, I, I will tell you tonight the budget amendment um, appropriate another uh, Amount of five, 263831 dollars of fund balance that you all passed in the, as part of the consent agenda. So that'll be about a four percent hit on the fund balance. We're, we'll still be slightly below our target of fifty percent of the budgeted expenditures for this year. Um, but uh, so that that number that number on the slide will change slightly next month. These were done before the approval of that budget amendment. Uh, the thing I really wanted to talk about tonight was ARP. 
and the American Recovery Plan funding. Um, as you're aware, Woodfin was allocated $2,140,000 as a grant. We, we received $1,070,000 last um, July and expect to see the, receive a similar amount June or July of this year. Um, the, the initial guidelines and what the town was allowed to appropriate those funds for were five different categories to support, to support public health and expenditures to address negative economic impacts on the public health emergency to replace lost revenue, to provide premium pay for essential workers and to invest in infrastructure, water, sewer, and broadband specifically. They gave uh, government organizations broad latitude under those categories to define justification and, and to determine their priorities, but uh, these, are, these are still the main funding categories. Over the last uh, week, the Treasury has come out with, they have finally activated their portal. They, they are asking all non-entitlement, well, all organizations, including non-entitlement units, which is what Woodfin is, to register under the Treasury's portal, appoint your administrator and your uh, people who have authority to go in and file reports for the town of Woodfin. We, we have done all that. And uh, they also came out with some additional guidance and guidelines and reporting requirements and more detail uh, surrounding that that we've been waiting on for a number of months. We'll be coming back to the board with some required um, policy that we'll need to adopt related to this funding. And I, I'd really like to suggest that we schedule a work session either next month or the following month so that the new board can go over all the spending require, uh, guidelines and, and uh, priorities and revisit the budget and the priorities that were originally established to see if, if what, what the desire of the board is today if, if we are still on track to um, continue with the spending the way it's currently budgeted or if you all would like us to refine that or head in a different direction and, and, and take a closer look now that we have some more definition um, regarding the guidelines surrounding this funding. It's a great opportunity for Woodfin. We have a lot of need, especially in the area of our infrastructure. So this is gonna be really great. We wanna make sure we spend it in exactly the right way and consistent with federal guidelines. Um, that being said, we, we're also monitoring the infrastructure bill and, and any available funding. They haven't really released details on how you apply for those funds yet. So um, we're, we're looking at that all the time and, and listening to the blogs on the school government. And um, I attend a, what they call an office hours training that Karen Malanzi does every week or two with the school government. They specifically talk about ARPA, but they've also announced that they're gonna have similar discussions around the infrastructure funding. So I'm glad Commissioner Edgerton brought that up tonight because that's gonna be something really important for Woodfin to pay attention to moving forward. Um, to date, we have only spent about 51,000 of um, the, the money that was allotted. These are the areas that we have spent it in. We've committed another $186,000 of the 2.14 um, million. So that, that's where we are today. <coughs> if, if, it's, if it suits the board and you all would like to do that, I'd like to suggest that we, we, we could either um, schedule a work session right before, say an hour before the next board meeting um, on, I believe it's January 18th, I think it's the Tuesday, or if you all prefer a different date and schedule more time, that's fine too. It's just whatever the board desires to do, but I'd like to schedule some sort of meeting in the next month or two. I think this is an important um, opportunity for the town and we wanna make sure we're spending this um, according to the, the direction you'd like this to go. And that's all I had. Thank you. This is really short and sweet. Um, Public Works, you have the stats in your packets also. Nothing outstanding, nothing out of the ordinary in Johnny's reports on that. The only contract that we've entered into since the last time the board met was uh, the one with Buncombe County Sheriff's Office for animal control transport. Um, I'd like to thank Penny, Penny for helping us get that 
contract or that agreement in place. Um, and uh, so that is to transport dogs, cats, strays to the animal shelter um, for their owners to go and collect them and for adoption to occur and all that good stuff. We'll just say good stuff. Um, and that's it for me. Okay, does anybody on the one more? Oh, we've got one more. Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. Probably some technology change here. Hope it works. Good evening again. General update on the Greenway and Blue Way projects. Um, advisory committee focus. Um, I've been Woodfin Parks and Recreation branding. Um, in a few more slides, I'll unveil the logo that we have come up with. Pretty excited about that. The Riverlink staff transition with the new di executive director. We've met with her. Um, went on the train ride, showed her the project. It's allowed us to refocus their efforts more towards fundraising because there's some opportunities with the TDA and Dogwood. So we've been discussing how we can approach that funding gap, which will be important as within the next month we'll get uh, revised cost estimates for Riverside Park and the way. So a little update on Silverline Park. We have, um, starting tomorrow, thankfully, we're gonna start paving, which I'm excited about. We've completed the boulder toll wall, and I'm targeting completion about sometime in February. A lot of that's weather dependent. Um, reviewed some change orders, I mentioned that last time. We still have a healthy contingency. I was able to push them a little bit. Um, basically, I th with the tremendous increase in pricing of materials, we thought that was fair to help compensate them for that. It wasn't, I don't think that's fair to, for them to absorb 50% cost increases on certain materials. So we did that, but uh, one thing I pushed them on was not, um, I'll help you pay and cover those costs, but we won't help you make money on paying for those costs. So we were able to get, not as much as I hope, but like just under $2,000 back from that. So we still have a healthy contingency to finish that project. <coughs> around 50,000 left. Um, again, I'll show you the logo. And hopefully, uh, depending on uh, where we land, probably next month, I'll have some renderings for what we're working on with that Silverline building. I don't have the display there, but um, of what some options that we can do. I need a price, once I get that, and I kind of try to ballpark some pricing on what those options may look. And then get a flavor and sense of where we can go with that. And um, I mentioned before, the, the challenge there is the it's in a floodplain and seven feet up is where that line is. So it makes it very hard to do much with that building. And I'll come back. Um, yeah, I'll, no, save pictures to last. That's what I like, i talk about that. Riverside Whitewater Wave. Um, We've already discussed that today. And with the Greenways, uh, working through the staffing change with Buncombe County, uh, working with Tim Love has taken on the, um, that as a interim position. So where we are right now is uh, he is working to uh, combine the Riverside portion as well as the Beaver Dam portion and, and trying to let that task order three. Um, where we are with task order two or the Riverside Drive Greenway is we have achieved that 25% uh, design set. So it's 114 pages. We're getting that ready for review and sent over to DOT for their review. So that's steadily progressing, which is good. And just like to keep that up there is when we're planning to start construction. So where we are with construction, this is, I, you gotta go out there if you haven't been out there, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's right in this curve of the river. It's, it is going to be beautiful. It is beautiful. And so this is what you're looking at is a completion of that boulder toe wall. It stretches probably, you know, a half of that park. They're steadily moving along. Uh, went out there before the meeting and grabbed some pictures because I saw that something was happening with this pirate ship. And so we're actually coming out of the ground now. 
Um, that and what you're, so that's the left-hand side. So they're steadily working on there. We probably see some delays or periods of no work because we're waiting on the mast. It's, they can only proceed, uh, progress so far without um, boxing themselves in. So if you, we'll see some work, but then we'll, we won't. The other two pictures um, are them prepping the greenway section of that park. So tomorrow they've got uh, asphalt scheduled to work in the paving. So we've had exceptionally great weather for December. It hasn't rained, so they've been able to really lock that site in. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll get most of the paving in. So where that'll land us, we'll leave everything just with the binder course and then we'll come back in the spring with the surface course and give it that last finishing touch. So. That's what I have. If any questions? All right. Oh wait, I forgot about this one. <laughs> so much for my uh, drum roll. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, I forget. Did we discuss how we came about this previously? Sorry. Yeah. I I could hear it again. So we entered into contract with. Reggie with design, um, Curve Solutions, and the process went through, he came to us, um, to the PM, no, I'm sorry, the PM, the communications subcommittee for that was, has already been in, in the works. Three to four different types of logos, we played with it. Um, he, we've got this branding guide now that describes each of the elements, what they mean, and I think that when I look at this and when I hear Reggie talk and explain how he came up with what these elements mean, and he'll say, well, this is what this means and this is what that means. I'm like, really? That's interesting because I thought that's what that was. <laughs> so it's, I think it's open for interpretation. And I'll probably stop there because I'm an engineer. And I'm going to start talking. I can tell you about asphalt and paving, but... The artistic side isn't there, but I, there's, um, and it might be helpful if I just send the branding document to you because then that would describe um, the elements of this. I think it's, uh, it, there's the water, there's the greenways, there's the, the road and the greenway intersecting. Even the little element that I liked was the, uh, in the middle, because it kind of it's it kind of has just a hint of where that wave is going on with this park because it's a, a big block in the in the logo. So anyway, it's we're all excited about it um, and we're progressing forward. And the advisory committee role on this is critical. Yes. Um, <coughs> the subcommittee, the communications subcommittee. Correct. I can say the about the uh, about the logo that over time we looked at. Even, for, even before you came on board, a, a lot of different logos. And when it came down to these few, there were a number of different comments, but this is the one that resonated with almost everybody, mm -hmm. but not necessarily for the same reason. And just like what you were just saying. Yeah, that's, that's kind of neat about it, is it kind of speaks to you differently. So, and I do believe that is all. That's the end of the report. Um, <coughs> it's rude. It's time for <laughs> what was the name? Okay, we need, we need to have a closed session. Uh, Eric, do you have any comments on the? I think, I think uh, Mr. Wilson might have a motion on the executive session. Yeah. Oh. Um, I make a motion that the town board enter into executive session for the following reasons permitted by North Carolina General Statute. Uh, do I need to read the statute number? Uh, statute 143-318-11A3. The public body may consider and give instructions to the attorney concerning the handling and settlement of a claim, judicial action, meditation, arbitration, or administrative procedure. Two, Status 143-318-11A5 
to establish or to instruct the public body staff a negotiating agent concerning the position to be taken by on behalf of the public body in negotiations, the price and other material material terms of the contract or post contract for acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease. And three, statute 143-318-.11A6 to consider the qualification, competence, performance, character, fitness, condition of appointment or condition of initial appointment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public office or employee. Okay, you heard the motion. We have a second. Mr. Mayor, I'd also like to add to that that the two bosses that we will be discussing, uh, I'm going to get the parties uh, and the name of the party so that would be in the record. Uh, one of them is uh, Larson versus Town of Brooklyn, and the other one is uh, Benson Gerald Edwards versus. State of North Carolina, Jason Young, and Officer Bradley. Okay. So you heard the motion, we have a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Yeah. Any opposed? Okay. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>